address last year, we spoke of our intention to forge a comprehensive social compact that would join all social partners in a common program to rebuild our economy and to enable higher growth. But I must say tonight that we have not been able to conclude a comprehensive social compact in the time frame we had envisaged because a new a number of new circumstances emerged that made it difficult for social partners to forge a consensus. But the good thing is, the good thing is, the social partners have expressed their intention. And I've been talking to them up till just yesterday. Both labor, business, and community, they have expressed a clear intention to conclude a social compact and have continued to work on a framework to enable joint action in key areas such as energy, transport, logistics, employment creation, and skills development. I have no reason to doubt the commitment that they have expressed to me. They have also identified a number of areas in terms of localization, social protection, crime and, co and corruption. While we remain committed to forging a new consensus amongst all sectors of our society, we have also undertaken practical collaborations in specific areas. Let me say it is not like processes of consensus building have not been going on. They have. A number of other compacts have been concluded amongst our social partners. We see the commitment of all social partners in the compacts that have been forged to fight COVID-19 pandemic, undertake the largest vaccination program where we worked very closely with business and labor. We have seen it in initiatives like the Solidarity Fund that mobilize society, that mobilize citizen activism and the funding to achieve common goals and in partnership to end, to end gender-based violence and femicide and also to respond to the effects of climate change. We have seen the benefits of this approach to promote investment and to develop master plans in sectors of the economy such as automotives, clothing and textiles. Many of us will remember that clothing and textiles had almost been wiped out in our country. Social partners got together and decided that we've got to save our clothing and textile industry. We've seen them work together in poultry, in sugar, agriculture, and global business services. The master plans that have been concluded are supporting the revival of various sectors of our economy. They're also bringing about investment by the private sector and yielding new jobs and supporting livelihoods. Welcome back, viewers. If you're just joining us, um, you are still watching uh, Parliament TV on Channel 408. We are literally minutes away from the State of the Nation Address debate, which is about to take place at um, the Cape Town City Hall, which is serving as the precinct, the parliamentary precinct for today's debate. Tim Binkles. Sibyl, yes, we are just uh, under a minute away from uh, the debate, but we've had quite interesting interviews this morning having spoken to the Secretary to the National Assembly, Mr. Kaso, yes. who briefly spoke on the joint rules, as you'll be aware of what happened last week uh, when the, uh, during the, the President's delivery of the, when the President was disrupted in any way uh, 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 before he delivered the State of the Nation address. So he said the rules are, have been put in place, the rules have been put in place, they are there, they are, it is the rules that, gu that guide these kinds of sitting, and the rules will be applied when the need arises. And if, absolutely. And of course, if we, we're just thinking about the role of the presiding officers, presiding officers have got a very important role to play to ensure that they enforce um, the rules 
and that they ensure that there is decorum in the House to ensure that the President, of course, in this case, that the President is able to deliver his State of the Nation address. We know that at the moment that members are literally walking into the chamber, the bells are ringing um, as members are actually getting ready to take their seats, and those who are supposed to be debating are lining up to go and um, deliver their speeches in relation to the comments, the questions, and the feedback um, in relation to the President's speech as delivered, the State of the Nation address, which was delivered on Thursday last week. And I'm sure it's going to be quite an interesting debate, having listened to members' reactions after the delivery of Absolutely. the State of the Nation address uh, last week. But we know that uh, it's those key uh, priorities, which is uh, uh, the load shedding, yes. uh, uh, unemployment, unemployment, and the uh, uh, rising cost of living, uh, crime and corruption. But I think for now we're probably almost ready to go into the House as you can see on the screen some of the members of the African National Congress there. You can see uh, Minerals uh, Minister, Mr. Gwede Mantasa, chatting there with uh, Mr. Frolic, as you had just spoken to him. Uh, I'm sure they had also quite a few interesting issues to raise. Yes, indeed. Uh, Mr. Frolic was actually just talking to us about how um, the approach that will be undertaken by both the National Council of Provinces and the National Assembly in ensuring that um, they not only take into account the commitments that were made by the President in his 2023 State of the Nation address, they are also obviously going to be focusing on um, the seven priorities within the ambit of the seven priorities, all of the key announcements that were made by the President since 2019 to where we are right now. So critical year to consolidate for committees and also he speaks about the data, um, the, the importance of using you know, um, 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 data that is reliable and ensuring that they, they, they use information that speaks to the current development landscape in the country and using that information in relation to uh, commitments made to ensure that committees are able to do targeted and outcome-based oversight. As we can see that the members are still in the process of walking into the chamber, um, not quite having taken their seats yet, we can see there, Minister in the Presidency, a number of members who are um, obviously just moving in um, into the seating area uh, to go and, and, and take their seats to get ready for this, um, this first day of the two-day uh, debate. And Sibo, I, I, I had an opportunity to also speak to the House uh, Chairperson of the NCOP, Mr. Joe Nyambi, who also yes. just outlined the plans that the NCOP will embark on, uh, having listened to the, having taken the cue from the President's State of the Nation address. We expect to see them in the next week or so, sitting for their strategic plans and then strategizing and planning for the year ahead. It's indicated that there might be one or two uh, of their op projects that they might need to carry into the seventh parliament. But as you can see on the screen, uh, members are getting seated, uh, are getting ready for this debate that is scheduled to start any moment from now on. Absolutely. And we expect to hear quite a lot from, uh, in particular, the position on the role of the Minister of Electricity. Because Absolutely. that's one thing that, that they really was about very last topical. Week. That was like such a topical issue with a lot of political parties indicating that they don't think it is um, a, a good decision to make. But of course, the president is coming with innovative ideas mm. and is trying his best to ensure that he brings, he puts solutions on the table. So for those who are saying that, okay, well, maybe um, it is not the appropriate uh, decision to take, we will probably hear from the political parties what their counter proposals are with regards to addressing the energy crisis in and the country. And the president outlined clearly, uh, he outlined that, look, we have a, there is an action plan to deal with energy crisis. So yes. This announcement on the appointment of the Minister of Electricity is part of that action plan. Yes. You know, as, as you'd remember, he did provide a progress. A lot has been done, although a lot still needs to be, needs done. To be done. But uh, we, we hope to hear what will come out of today's debate. And it, it is, it obviously, we, we are poised to see a very, uh, to witness a very interesting um, first day of, of debates, especially with what happened last uh, week uh, those few disruptions before the president could actually deliver his address. So we can actually expect that there will, there's going to be robust engagement from all 14 uh, political parties that are represented uh, in parliament, as well as uh, the special delegates that are coming through the NCOP um, list from the provincial legislators as well, who will be participating in today's um, joint 
debate. There is, uh, we can see the deputy chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, the Honorable Ms. Sylvia Luke, who um, is also to walking towards the seat. I think now we can just go to the house and follow the proceedings there. Honorable members, all the honorable members, before we proceed with the debate of the State of the Nation Address, I wish to remind all of us of Chapter 2A of the Joint Rules of Parliament, especially Part 1 which deals with order in joint sittings and the rules of debate. In this regard, I wish to highlight the following. Rules 14b states that no member shall converse aloud. Rule 14c states that no member shall interrupt another member while speaking except to call attention to a point of order or a question of, of privilege. Rule 14E states that whenever the presiding officer addresses members during a debate, any member then speaking or seeking to speak shall resume his or her seat and the presiding officer shall be heard without in interruption. Rule 14G states that, quote, if the presiding officer is of the opinion that a member is deliberately contravening a provision of these rules, or that a member is in, in, in contempt of or is disregarding the authority of the chair, or that a member's conduct is grossly disorderly, he or she may order the member to withdraw immediately from the chamber for the remainder of the sitting close quote. The secretary will now read the order of the day. Debate on the president's state of the nation address. No, thank you very much. Um, honorable members, I have received a copy of the President's address that was delivered at the joint sitting on the 9th of February 2023. The speech has been printed in the, in the minutes of the joint sitting. I will now proceed, honorable members, to call on the honorable Ch the chief whip of the majority party to take the podium. Thank you very much, um, House Chair of the NSOP, the Speaker, the President of the Republic of South Africa, the Deputy President, Honorable Members, distinguished guests from the gallery, Manene Namanene Gazi, fellow South Africans, we are our Secretary for Parliament, Utati Kava, Kanza Utet, 
fellow South Africans, Ngalenta Zana and Yabulisa. Good morning, Huya More, Abusheni, Nyalocha, Dumelang Sanbona and Mulweni. Ekameni Longbuto Wesizwe, the African National Congress. Yes, uh, I'm sure we'll ask the table to look at the problem, uh, but please proceed, uh, uh, Chief Whip. Yeah, the problem is being attended to. Please proceed, Chief Whip. Can I proceed? I've already greeted um, this Ogat House. A Kamen Lomuto Olili Falisizwe. The ANC didn't want to allow Kala and Gokamkela and Lokasa in data. It is hard. Ebeke bileyo ebeko munga melwe sizwe gomsha weto ba kulenzi abantu bom zanza Afrika ba beke kuintende ya bo ubo miba bo kumuto we sizwe ukandu valo ukokela isizwe songe nelizwe lipela ogu kona kugundo okuti njengo kumuto we sizwe pansi kwa skokelo espume zanza skamu munga meli hindo yoba sense ingu tu eskaule zileyo kumi ba yenta lo loko osho kumpi lo zabantu. Bagoe to Bapile Ubomi, Obunono Kundobu Abapila Yongalumsu. The President also outlined commitments to taking decisive action, address challenges affecting the nation through placing the people's interest in the center of the process of change. I am moved by the memory of the towering icon of our struggle, Utalipunga, Utata Umandela, Holsasa who stood a few meters from here 33 years ago as a free citizen after spending 37, 27 years in the Upper Epoles Mona, Seropen Island. It was a historic event that marked the turning point in the liberation struggle in South, Af of, in South Africa's march to freedom and democracy. Sentenced to life imprisonment, his release breathed new life and hope into the nation that that for decades echoed the struggle song, We Shall Overcome. Today, it is that same spirit of hope and resilience that we are drawing upon the face of a myriad of challenges that confront us. We must remain true to that spirit of, of, of resilience, and each of us must do all in our power to work together to fight poverty and reduce inequality and corruption and address the energy crisis. We don't speak about poverty as it is, a fa it is in fashion, but we speak about po poverty because it is politically correct to do so. We have lived that life and we are, and, and it is us who have been motivated to persevere to greatness through poverty. Tinasia Zana Genenjala. The ANC has a mandate not to use this podium for cheap politicking, but to communicate the achievements of this government. Working together with social partners to implement the commitments made in the previous State of the Nation address, the ANC speakers will address the nation and debunk the falsehood that some opposition parties are, and some media houses have been repeating that this president and the government f has not done anything for the past four years. They've been making empty process, promises. We acknowledge that the president of our, the president or the national government 
alone cannot solve the myriad of challenges and problems that are affecting our country. The grandstanding and pontification we are about to witness here in the next two days by some parties, it will be a clear display of abuse and of serious debate for political campaigning. Asikanyeli ukuba imitseli mgeni ikona. Iye yensi ngalolonge itaisha, ishala iba yokala ukufuma, ukuba zikona iziwo, ukutataka nezipene, ezikuwe zinye zama ziko, okunumende, unja alonje, inka ninge imizekelo yokufunuka kwe zinga, lokuphunguka kwa Owenzi wey yung hulumende umzekelo obonagala yung lobo tetwangawo in lela abas abas abafundi abaseben zengayo be kokela ngo tishala abas nigeleyo abafundi sin sampo esmabulelayo. The NC is not in denial about the state of the provision of basic services and infrastructure such as water, human settlement, transport, electricity, bridges, and uh, bed road infrastructure. We need investment in new infrastructure projects and funding in maintenance. The national interest is our utmost priority and the rule of law as a cornerstone of our constitutional democratic state must be maintained at all times. What is a people's parliament? It is important that we remind one another that in deepening accountability, parliament provides oversight as a tribune of the people and is expected to promote rule of law. Since seen here last Thursday by some uh, parliamentarians heading to confront the president of the Republic of South Africa must be condemned and the joint rules must take its course. These few parliamentarians are an embarrassment to the country and to the nation because we are not a violent nation as South Africans. We know how to process our issues. Quindiato ya sizwe kwi vege pelile ya umonga melu skubuzile si sonke apa okokuba abantu wa mzansa Afrika abana wa amanda no monde wa mtuto wa masele umbodamu umchocho no mbaizelo wa makwengwe esubone ukuba gulendu bafuna ukuba izenzo nezi sombululo kuzo zonke izindo zo hulumende a lot of hot air is going to be blown about the government declaration of a national state of disaster to respond to the electricity crisis and its effects. The critics of this approach miss the most important element of the intervention, namely the strong central coordination and decisive action needed to deal with the national crisis of, of energy. President and government is heading to a call made by the citizens of South Africa that this government must add load shedding. This government must stabilize energy throughout by intervening. The comprehensive plan to attend to electricity challenges must be implemented, Honorable President, with immediate effect, with speed. We are awaiting for the Minister of Electricity to gallop on this matter. Dabayena ya electricity ki homu ya mushate. Waihama umuladu, wailisha umuladu, kanti nifuna ndoni. Government has responsibility to cushion all citizens with incentivizing and subsidization of solar roof panels. Vandalism of infrastructure and stealing of cables is tantamount to sabotage and counter-revolution. These criminal acts must be dealt with ruthlessly. In Jongo Zokuba Maguze Nessis Kwanzuso, in Joyoba Abantu Mabapume Glossimitimi, Nobu Nyama, Ngo Babus, Busela Emva, Kwasoko Kosho. There's an urgent need that, chale, that faces the challenges of a local government, what, which must be attended to by the national government through the review of the municipal fiscal model, including the division of revenue, in order to avail resources to meet the needs of the people in the sphere, prioritizing basic and fundamental needs of our people. Provincial and local governments, tra traditional leaders, religious fraternity, youth movement, the workers, the business sector, also must come on board as they, they did in the NETLEC 
framework when the nation responded to COVID-19. When we adopted the style of working, we were able to build new capabilities such as fusion center, whereby different law enforcement agencies work together to tackle crime and corruption. The Auditor General worked with government departments and entities to introduce real-time audits, and we want to really appreciate that. The Department of Employment and Labor created tariffs ben to benefit a benefit scheme whereby the UIF paid benefits to workers through the bargaining council and employees. The Department of Social Development also able within weeks to roll out a new social grant to help the unemployed and cushion the indigent, thus laying foundation for the basic in income grant that we had debated for decades. Our threat record speaks for itself, but challenges we do ac accept that they grow daily. These capabilities were built Within a, re a relative short time, they stand as a proof that South Africans have the capacity to unleash solutions for all our problems. What we need is leadership that is capable to, ins to inspire us and mobilize our energy towards same goals. Robust oversight by the parliamentary committees must be intensified to prevent the mismanagement of public funds. As the ANC, we have a rich history of struggle of mobilizing our people to move mountains. We did it in various moments to overcome oppressive system. There is nothing that can not uh, be done now, as we have done with the past laws in 1952. We mobilized volunteers to collect aspirations of our people through the Freedom Charter of 1955, the Congress movement of our National uh, Women's March in 1956, and we launched the UDF in 1983. Given all these, we are going to draw our experience to mobilize all South Africans to, to partner with government to solve the problems, not to leave anyone behind. We feel the pain of our people who are experiencing the skyrocketing cost of living, and we call on our own government to expand the safety net for poor and working class. We also call on the business sector to ra not to raise prices of basic foodstuff, keep prices as low as possible. We feel the pain of the women and girl children, in particular who are daily victims of gender-based violence and femicide. We congratulate the police, the prosecu prosecutors, who make sure that violent crimes are put behind, uh, uh, violent criminals are put behind the bars. Our task as the citizens of South Africa is to heal the horrific condition of society by working together. We pay special tribute and condolences to the artists who died in the line of entertainment. DJ, somebody, Mbincha, AKA, the member of the South African National Defense Force, who was, a, who was part of the keeping force in DRC, such as Mabena, and all other heroes and heroines. To government of the people of Turkey and Syria, after a terrible earthquake, we took of more than 37,000 to date. To our four provinces that are experiencing a flood at the moment, we're happy that a declaration has been done. We know the prevalence of young people in our population on ongoing challenges of youth unemployment in our country. We call on government to play an active leading a role by revival of the presidential working group. Allow me to invoke the profound words of our iconic writer, the late Professor Eskail Mpatela, whose centenary we celebrate this year, I quote, everybody who is willing to work and has a nation-building vision rather than aspirations for a sectoral power base should be allowed to come forward and contribute ideas, and hence, I close quote. Let us, let us take the heed of the President Ramaphosa's wise words in SONA 2023 address that, I quote, to build such a society, to overcome the great difficulties of the moment, we need to work together, we need to stay the course and intensify our collective efforts to grow South Africa. No one must be left behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. Uh. Honorable Pema Todina, uh, honorable members, uh, just a, 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 for you to know that uh, the matter of the aircon is being attended to. Uh, so uh, please be, be patient. Uh, the, the, the issue is, is being uh, addressed. Uh, we'll now move on to the next speaker. Uh, Honorable the Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. 
Honorable Speaker, Mr. President and fellow South Africans. In January 2019, a select group of business executives were invited to a dinner on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. At that dinner, the host stood up and described the term and office of South Africa's former president, Jacob Zuma, as nine wasted years. And influential people who attended that dinner said that they were impressed with the forthrightness of the comment. According to one attendee, and I quote, it made me think about how the country had been run in the last years. We lost some of the gains that we had, end quote. And who was the speaker at that dinner? It was none other than President Cyril Ramaphosa talking about the administration of his ANC predecessor. As we look back now on that early period of the Ramaphosa presidency, through the lens of this year's State of the Nation address, we arrive at one inescapable conclusion, that you, Mr. President, are somehow guilty of something even worse than the thing that you once accused Zuma of. For if President Zuma presided over nine wasted years, you, sir, have presided over five disastrous years. If you thought that we lost some gains under Zuma, then under this administration, we have gained only losses. To quote one of the ANC's favorite thinkers, Karl Marx, history repeats itself, first as tragedy and then as farce. And that is exactly what you have wrought on South Africa, Mr. President. What happened under Zuma was a tragedy, but what has happened under your watch is a farce. The new dawn was a false dawn. Ramaphoria was a delusion. Your supposed commitment to sweeping economic reform was hollow. Unemployment has skyrocketed from 36% to 43% since Mr. Ramaphosa became president. Murder has increased by 20% over the same period, with 70 people killed in our country every single day. And as we all know, the rolling blackouts have now become a daily feature of permanent life under the Ramaphosa era. In fact, when he became president in 2018, South Africa spent a total of six days under load shedding. We thought back then that we had hit rock bottom. Since then, it has gone up every single year. First to 22 days, then to 35 days, then to 48 days, and last year, it grew to 157 days. Sadly, it looks like 2023 is going to smash all these despicable records. Already this year, we've had over 1,000 hours of consecutive load shedding and counting. Mr. President, you may not have realized it, but this year's SONA was actually your last chance to lead the country onto a fundamentally different and better path. Last Thursday, you spoke to a nation that had arrived on the banks of a great river. On this side of the river, behind us, lay the treacherous road we have walked for the past three decades under the ANC. This is the socialist approach that the party embarked upon in 1997, when they formally adopted the policy of cater deployment in order to, and I quote, control every lever of the state, unquote. His party believes that if the state controls the economy, it will be better than the people controlling the economy through open markets. They believe that the best way to deliver affordable, reliable energy supply for the nation is for the ANC to keep full control of South Africa's energy production. They believe that the best way to provide affordable rail transport for the nation is to keep full control of the railways with the ANC. They believe that the best way to manage a pandemic is to 
centralize all control in a national command center for them to decide who must be locked down and who mustn't, who can work and who cannot. And that is why this road is mocked by stage six load shedding that reaches into the homes of every single South African every single day. It's mocked by failing public services, by hospitals that cannot treat the sick, by trains that cannot run, and by a police service that can no longer keep us safe. These are no longer warnings about what will happen under the ANC's failed approach of centralized state control. This is now the daily reality of life in South Africa. Yet, as we stood on that riverbank last Thursday, we could look across to the other side. We saw a road extending to a fundamentally different and better future. But to get there, to turn our backs on decades of failed ANSI policies, we first had to cross that great river, knowing that if we ever did get to the other side, the rushing torrent would ensure that we never, ever went backwards. On Thursday, a courageous leader who really cared about this nation would have had the head and the heart to admit that his party is wrong, that it is time to cross the Rubicon and embrace the opposite of socialism, which is power to the people. Now make no mistake about it, South Africa was ready to cross that river. The men and women of this country are tired to their very core of the abuse that this ANC government has put them through. On last Thursday, we looked to you, sir, our president. We asked you to show us the way across the river, to unleash the power of the market to solve our electricity crisis, to get the incapable state out of the way of the incredible resourcefulness and creativity of the South African people to put us on the road to socio-economic freedom that all of the world's prosperous nations have traveled. Because we don't want to rely on being resilient. We want to rely on being resourceful. We don't want to rely on meager social grants. We want to rely on our own jobs and businesses. We don't want to rely on your cadres. We want to rely on ourselves. And what did our leader do on that riverbank with the fate of our nation at stake? President Sora Ramaphosa could not cross the Rubicon. Even as our nation pleaded for him to do the right thing and to take us onto this hopeful new path on the other side of the great Rubicon River, he couldn't take his eyes off the rapids. Even as the people of South Africa raised their voice in unison and frustration, all he could do was stare, terrified at the challenge. Instead of leading us across the Rubicon at the Sona of this year, Mr. Ramaphosa told us to turn around, to stay on this side of the riverbank, to double down on the same failed policies and the ANC approach of state control that has landed us in this terrible mess. Too weak, too indecisive and too cowardly to take on the cadres, the compromised and the vested interests in his, the political party that he leads. He turned his back on the Rubicon, he turned his back on us, and he turned his back on the only pathway that can save this country. Instead of getting the state out of the way of private electricity generation, he gave sweeping powers to the very same minister who abused those powers during the COVID crisis last year. Instead of deregulating and unleashing private sector electricity generation, he has centralized even more power in his super presidency. Instead of privatizing failed state-owned enterprises, he's created a massive new state-owned enterprise to provide fresh looting opportunities for the cadres. Instead of removing incompetent ministers of energy and public enterprises who block reform, he added yet another ministry to his already bloated cabinet. Mark this, 
by once again expanding and rather than shrinking the role of the state, the president has all but guaranteed that load shedding and all the other terrible crises visited on the people of South Africa by his government will only get worse. But a curious thing also happened last Thursday after the Sona. Mr. Ramaphosa clearly believed that the people would simply follow him as he told us to turn back away from the Rubicon. He took for granted that people would just oblige and follow him back down the road to decay and decline. He has gravely miscalculated. Instead of following him, the people have stayed put, their eyes firmly transfixed on the promise of prosperity and hope on the opposite shore. The response to President Ramaphosa's Sona makes it clear that he has placed the party political interests of his own dying party ahead of the interests of the people of South Africa one too many times. By cowering from the Rubicon, he has lost the support of the country. And last Thursday will forever be remembered as the day that history overtook President Ramaphosa. By failing to listen to the cries of the people and doubling down on the failed ideologies that caused the suffering, the government has deserted us. But that does not mean that we can't still cross this great river. Yes, Tumamina was an empty slogan. Yes, the new dawn was a cruel mirage. And yes, Palapala showed us who he really is. And yes, we too wonder, as he said, why he is still doing the job. Gave us the real impression that this job is nothing but a side hustle for him. Because it is now quite clear that President Ramaphosa has failed. But you know what? Thanks to our democracy, we are never wholly dependent on one person. Our democracy offers us the way across the Rubicon. But there is a catch. Because now that the president has failed to lead us, we have to build a bridge across those raging waters ourselves at the next national elections. During his speech, the president claimed that we are defined by platitudes like hope and resilience. Wrong, Mr. President. We are a nation that should be defined by our commitment to a constitutional democracy. Because it is democracy that offers us a way out when all leaders have to offer is empty and hollow platitudes. And it's precisely for moments like this when the leader fails this nation that we have a democracy. We want to get this country onto a better path before load shedding and the terrible policies and decline make it impossible to recover. It's time to use our democracy. And let there be no doubt, there is only one party that offers our country a realistic way across the Rubicon and onto a better path. While ANC run municipalities collapse, there's only one party that is systematically fixing municipalities like Midval in Gauteng, Umgeni in KwaZulu-Natal, and Kocha in the Eastern Cape. As Kader deployment and corruption rips apart the very fabric of the state, there's only one party that runs a clean and competent government in the Western Cape. And as power cuts get worse by the day, there is only one party working day and night in the province and the city to shield people from load shedding. That is why, that is why Cape Town became the first government of the country to start buying electricity directly from the open market and with hundreds of megawatts of power still to come. That party, and the only party to save South Africa is the Democratic Alliance. And so today, and so today, 
I stand before the people of our country not to offer you more idealistic dreams, bullet trains, smart cities, and empty talk of hope. We tried the idealism of the new dawn. It was a false dawn. So now we must try pragmatism. For that is what the DA offers our country. A credible, pragmatic, realistic set of solutions that will get our country working again and get us across that Rubicon once and for all. Where the ANC offers more of the same by assigning more power over our lives to the incapable state, the DA offers to give power back to the people where it belongs. Rather than seeking to control all the levers of power, the DA stands for something different. For liberal democracy, where power and economic decisions are decentralized into the hands of the people where it belongs. Accountability, non-racialism, commitment to the rule of law, and an inclusive social market economy that embraces the private and public sectors as partners with zero tolerance for corruption. It is these timeless principles that have helped us turn around those municipalities and get this government in the Western Cape onto the path where it is now the best run provincial administration in the country. And by voting DA in 2024, we can bring this to bear at a national level. And let's be clear, the DA is the only game in town. Because anybody who seriously wants to cross that Rubicon must understand the binary. The latest polling shows that we are just 10 percentage points behind the ANC. They've dropped to 37%, we're on 27%, and we are closing that gap. Support for them has crashed. And no matter how anyone spins it, our country faces a binary. Next year, the government will, a national government will either be an ANC-led coalition or it will be a DA-led coalition. We will either have a yellow coalition trapped on the wrong side of that riverbank, suffering misery and poverty, or we will have a blue coalition led by the DA that leads us across the Rubicon towards a better and brighter future. Honourable Speaker, the people of South Africa know what needs to be done to fix the country. They are ready to embrace private electricity generation, to privatise failed state-owned enterprises, to replace the terrible race-based policies that only empower the connected elite with non-racial policies that are targeted towards lifting poor people out of poverty and into opportunity. The people of our country are ready to cross the Rubicon. And the good news is, we can still do it. We're just going to have to do it without President Ramaphosa. By uniting behind the DA next year, we can cross that Rubicon. We can leave behind the corrupt state-led paradigm for good. And South Africa, on the other side of the Rubicon, awaits a new country, where load shedding and corruption are a thing of the past, where quality education and health care are available to all where millions of people can move out of poverty and into opportunity, and where all of us feel safe. And the truth is, the ANC is not going to lead us to that future. They are the past. The challenges we face are large, and yes, tough battles lie ahead of us. But outside this city hall and across the length and breadth of South Africa, there are millions of ordinary, hard-working citizens who are desperate for change. In the face of growing hardship inflicted by the government, these are the people who still get up every day to try and build a better life for them and their families. These are the people that we have alongside us. Together we can build a land of prosperity and opportunity, but we're going to need a government that's working for us not against us. And the only way we can get there is by using our democracy next year to elect a DA government, a government with the courage to do what President Ramaphosa couldn't and cross that Rubicon. Thank you. Thank you very much. We will now proceed.
We now proceed to the Minister in the Presidency. Thank you, Honorable Chair, Madam Speaker, oh, Honorable Chair, President of the Republic, His Excellency Matamela Ramaphosa, Deputy President David Mabuza, mm -hmm. colleagues in the executive and members of parliament, members of our provinces, members of the media, the people of South Africa. I guess the biggest challenge we are going to be confronted with, like one would have tried to say it last year, the difference again between facts and ideas. Where we are sitting, DA believes that ANC is obsessed with government control where everything is done by government. It's only when you ignore facts to be able to think along that path. Already as we work now, for the first time, ESCO, Electricity Supply in South Africa, the intervention program diversifies the various sources of energy. The fact that we have lifted the ceiling for private sector to generate capacity, that cannot be an obsession with the control of government. As we speak now, we are ensuring that there is a move to secure energy on an emergency basis. Where we are sitting, as we speak now, there is, under the leadership of this president, acceleration of procurement of energy from renewables, from battery using the battery storage, at the same time accessing gas. This is a diversified access to energy. Now, two, again to deal with facts. For anyone to believe what DA says, you must have not been able to see the intervention of the Vulindela program that deals with economic reforms. And the intention of that program already on the move is to ensure that there's water availability. And also the president said here, we have reduced number of years for water license from multiple years to 90 days so that private sector that applies for water license is able to access that license. Again, for you to say this government is obsessed with control of government, you must actually ignore those facts. Our program is clear with regard to interventions to unlock and deal with the regulatory cost in as far as SMMEs are concerned. SMMEs, in the manner they are, are not ANC. It's a small, medium enterprise. These are small, medium enterprise. This is private sector. Those structures, Honorable Stase, are not ANC. So that intervention, led by Sipongosi, working together with the Department of Small Business, is unlocking the path for small business to participate. That cannot be viewed as is unless you are obsessed with the denial of facts. Again, an ANC government is a transformative government. If you, if you want to say where DA leads, you've consciously said nothing about the state of Tswane. You've consciously said nothing about the state of Johannesburg. You've consciously said nothing about the fact that one of your mayors have dropped the ball in the street 
because of no less than 100 billion unauthorized expenditure. That is a DA mayor. Again, when you say DA does well, it's because you're obsessed in a very blindfolded way with this metro, which has passed the test of racial exclusion. All black townships here in this metro, services are in a dire state. You go to Kailisha, you go to Filippi, you go to Kuguletu. I have been in those townships, Honorable Stazer. The police stations are in a dire state. Everything, right? Let me. The point is, the point is, the point that I'm making to you is that Western Cape, Western Cape is, is a test of resilience of racial exclusion. You have not run, when you go to Joburg and you do juxtaposition, you do a contrast when Joburg was run by the African National Congress. Look at the financial, look at the financial ratios. You will never pass the test of financial management as the time Pakistan was running Joburg. You can go to Tswane when Tswane was run by Sputla Ramkhoba. You look at the financial ratios, you look at the focus, you look at the transformative program. There can be no comparison. You know what? It's because you deny facts, right? Fortunately, 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 in 2024, our people are very clear about facts. They know that DA's future is based on a racially exclusive South Africa. However, having said that, Having said that, now they know that in dealing with ESCO, as we sit here, there's a focus on six powered stations, on six, uh, on, on six uh, power stations. Resources and people are being deployed to make sure that those power stations, which have been found to be the main contributors to the, actually to the slow trading, are attended to. As we speak now, there's a clear plan to reduce the debt burden on ESCOM to make sure that ESCOM is able to release resources to, pro to improve on maintenance and ensure that transmission lines, those are facts. So, I think your fear, Mr. Honorable uh, Stazen, if you look at the facts previously, look at the facts, where there's a survey about respect and trust of leaders, you don't feature in the same space with our president. Those are facts. They are not done by me. It's not my research. It's not my research. And this year's State of the Nation address by the president is historic in many ways. It signals, it signals many rays of possibilities and an imminent end to a rather devastating period which was ushered in COVID-19, by COVID-19 catastrophic floods, serious case of corruption and maladministration that were laid bare at the State Capture Commission and an energy crisis. Indeed, as the President indicated, we have seen the resilience of South Africans and are constantly, constantly inspired by our belief that tomorrow will be better. As a result, we are witnessing the resurgence of the economy with our growth figures of third quarter 2022. Economy grew two quarters last year. Economy grew no less than two times from the labor survey. Net jobs, no less than 648,000. First labor survey, no less than 200,000. Those are facts. The declaration of the national state of disaster will assist in speedy resolution of energy supply whilst minimizing its impact and contributing immensely in the rebuilding process. What are we doing here? As we deal 
were the causes of shortage of, of shortage of power and load shedding. At the same time, disaster seeks to intervene to make sure that we are at a pace and actually are able to prevail over the damage that load shedding is causing, at the same time deal with the impact. That's what the state of disaster is about. The sixth administration is in its penultimate year. In 2024, we'll go back to South Africans to seek a renewed mandate based on facts and we are confident we will receive it because we are a government that is committed to improving the lives of each and every South African. That is based on facts. Because we are a government that leaves no one behind, no one behind, we leave no Philippi behind, we leave no Kukuletu behind, we leave no, we leave no black township behind. We have placed public accountability at the center of building an ethical and a capable developmental state as set out in the NDP Vision 2030. To advance accountability, the President has appointed various commissions to deal with corruption. That is the river you cannot cross with us. The river that this President is leading us to cross is the river where fraud stars will not be allowed on the other side of the river. To restore public trust, and to restore the credibility of the key institutions. Arrests have been demonstrated. Key kingpins have appeared before court. As we speak now, multi party discipline in, in ESCOM has arrested no less than 43 people. The Commission of Inquiry into Tax Administration and Governance at South African Revenue Service resulted in an overhaul of SARS and it being turned into one of the most efficient and well-performing public entities in this country. I know, Honorable States, you cannot speak about the state of SARS because to speak about the state of SARS, you must command this government. The only way you can live, you can make sense, you must ignore those facts. Last year, SARS broke revenue collection records, collecting over 1.2 trillion in revenues after rescue under the leadership of this president. The Commission of Inquiry into Public Investment Corporation highlighted widespread abuses and governance failures at the PIC and ongoing reforms are rebuilding in the institution. The National Prosecution Authority's investigating directorate, directorate has already begun preparing for trial cases emanating from the Commission of Inquiry into state capture and last year several arrests were made. The idea has enrolled 32 matters involving 187 accused persons. Six new matters involving 22 accused have been enrolled since the president tabled his response to the State Capture Commission in October. The president continues to work closely with the Special Investigation Unit to improve the monitoring and coordination of referrals arising from the SIU investigation. These SIU interventions are bearing fruit with some of the looted money being returned by multinationals and others. SI investigations to COVID-19 procurement proclamation R2020 2020 has to date resulted in 456 referrals to accounting officers for disciplinary actions. 63 officials have been found Can guilty. Conclude, 476 referrals have been made to appear before the NPA for possible criminal investigation. Indeed, we will cross the river based on facts under the leadership of the ANC. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is going to be Honorable Malima. But Honorable Members, please note, please note the following. Please note the following that uh, when Honorable Malima exceeds his 20 minutes, he will take from Honorable Mendes' time, which is 12 minutes, and the table will keep us informed uh, as it proceeds. Yes. Please proceed. Thank you very much. Uh, we take this opportunity to acknowledge the leadership of the EFF and present here the officials. Yes, uh, honorable member, just a, a, a minute, uh, Honorable Malima. 
Honorable member, what's your point of order? Speaker, on the point of order, I'm rising to find out what is Honorable Malema going to debate. He was not part of the Sona. There's nothing for him to debate. He must sit down. No, unfortunately, Honorable Member, that's not the point of order. Please proceed, Honorable Malema. I have no time for boys. We take this opportunity to acknowledge the leadership of the EFF present here, the officials, commissars from the CCT, PCT, RCT, and BCT members, the ground forces of the uncompromising movement watching from all over the country and the continent, including the African diaspora, importantly, the people of South Africa. We also acknowledge the leadership of the opposition parties present here in Parliament. Under normal circumstances, we're supposed to acknowledge a president and a speaker of Parliament. But for a very long time now, and particularly after the revelations of crimes in Palapala, we can boldly state that the South Africa does not have head of state and president. The one who was here, there before, has renounced this constitutional privilege to continue as president of the Republic of South Africa. South Africa's constitution obliges anyone who is elected as a president to uphold, respect, and defend the constitution. And we can say boldly here that Mr. Ramaphosa has failed to uphold, respect, and defend the constitution. The misconduct of the speaker on the 9th of February 2023 has also disqualified her as a legitimate speaker of parliament. The speaker referred to members of this house as animals and violated the constitution and the rules of the National Assembly when she allowed the police to invade parliament and made it worse by calling on the security forces of South Africa to enter the chambers to intimidate peaceful members of parliament who had their hands up holding placards to protest against the sole director of Ntaba Nyoni Estate PTYLTD. The company that owns Palapala Farm in Limpopo and unlawfully engaged in trade through currencies that cannot be used in South Africa. As a result, we have already submitted a motion of no confidence against Mrs. Nosiviwe Mapisa Nakula, and we officially withdraw our honor we previously showed her. We also apologize for having showed her the honor when she evidently does not respect parliament, does not respect the laws of this country, and can do everything to stay in office. Under no circumstances should a democratic parliament be harassed and intimidated by the state security forces. The Constitutional Court has ruled that the police must stay away from lawmakers. It is the responsibility of the Speaker of Parliament to make sure that members of Parliament execute their responsibility without any fear or intimidation. But once you usher in police inside the chambers, you are effectively saying and allowing the tyrant to intimidate and even possibly prosecute those who disagree with the tyrant. The police must never be allowed inside the chamber because that is where the executive is held accountable. And those who are in power, if they do not have answers, may be tempted to use the security forces to intimidate those who are holding them accountable. I've known the president of the ANC longer than many of you, and he has known me when I was very young. Under no circumstances will he ever be threatened by me, or can he feel that his life is under threat because Julius is next to him. I've been next to him before. Many of you joined the ANC, including the second Deputy Secretary General of the ANC. So there is no need for you to behave like you can protect him um, against the people who sit with him in the chamber and he does so without even having bodyguards, without being intimidated. The president himself said when he was playing golf the following day that he never felt intimidated, neither was he scared when he was in this parliament.
So who are you saying? What are you saying? The people who use your own stomachs to think. The president has put you under the bus. Those who said the president was under threat. He said himself was never under threat. Neither was he intimidated. So what were the police doing here? They were here because the speaker has lost total control of this parliament and that's why she must step down. We take this opportunity to pay tribute to fearless ground forces and volunteers who gathered 10 years ago in Uncle Tom's Hall and set economic freedom in our lifetime. The organization that you started 10 years ago is a force to be reckoned with and a fighting instrument in the hands of the people. Despite the fact that you, as ground forces of the EFF, defined the EFF to be, amongst other things, a protest movement, you also said we are a government in waiting. As we are talking here today, we are a government in the city of Johannesburg where the EFF was founded. And the EFF is responsible for public safety and health care and social development. We can assure the people of Johannesburg that the crime in the economic capital of South Africa will go down and our communities will receive better primary health care which will be premised on massive public education on health care and health matters. Public safety is what we are going to ensure. We will demonstrate to the people of Johannesburg that we will reduce the levels of contact crime, murder, robberies, car hijackings, assault with intention to do grievous bodily harm in all crime spots of Johannesburg, particularly Hillbro, GP, Central Johannesburg, Orange Farm, Alexander, Ivory Park, Hanichu, and Midran. We will not tolerate criminals anywhere in the city of Johannesburg. Our energy services must a minute, uh, Honorable Malima, emergency. just a minute. Uh, I see your hand is up, uh, Honorable Member. Can I find out on what point I will rise? Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I am rising on uh, 14P. The, the Honorable Member on the podium have taken this very same house, have litigated the very same house, who have been schooled by him that the President have taken... No, you can howl. We have been schooled by that one. Listen. Listen, we have been schooled by that one. He told us that the president has taken parliament to court. Therefore, president cannot address this house. The very same thing he has done it. He does not have any standing to address this house. He is a delinquent. He disrupts the house. Therefore, he must also not be allowed to address the house. house chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, honorable member. But that's not a point of order, unfortunately. Please proceed, honorable member. There is a difference between addressing and debating. Very thin line. I'm not addressing, I'm debating. The organ. Mm -hmm. We can assure the people I, of Johannesburg. Honorable Malima, I see there's another hand. Please uh, sit for a minute. Honorable member, please start off by indicating on what point of order are you rising? On what point are you rising? On what point? Chair, I'm raising on a point of order, quoting Article 14P, on the use of offensive languages by Honorable Mahorme Jamalema, who undermined the president and undermined the house by using offensive languages the last time. Now, before Mahorme continues to address Mahoro Major must first apologize to the parliament or he must not address because we can't be addressed by Mahoro Major who undermines this parliament. Thank you very much, Honorable Member. Honorable Members, can I really make a plea that uh, when we rise on a point of order, it should really be a point of order. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm not going to really uh, uh, allow any other person to make a speech in the pretext of uh, 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 raising a, a point of order. Please desist from doing so. Honorable Malima. 
Thank you very much. The health and social development, the primary principle and approach of the EFF to healthcare is based on primary health care and accessibility of clinics for 24 hours. Each and every ward in the city of Johannesburg must have health care facility, whether it is a hospital clinic, poly or mobile clinic. What primary health care means is that our nurses and departments of health as a whole must not wait for patients to come to them only when they are terminally ill and require expensive and sophisticated health care operations. Primary health care means that the Department of Health must perpetually and permanently raise awareness and conduct massive public education of essential preventative health issues confronting our communities. Our health department will work with schools, community forums, and community-based organizations to publicly educate our people on preventative health care measures. We will make sure that all the acting positions, both in public safety and in health and social development in Johannesburg, are filled so that we can give our people a proper service. The EFF remains the only dependable and reliable weapon for the total liberation of the working class and Africans here in South Africa, the African continent and the African diaspora. Throughout the year, we'll be celebrating the 10 years existence of the EFF and preparing for a journey ahead. We take this opportunity to say to the people of South Africa, what you are listening to is not a real state of the nation, it's a hearsay. Our country is in the middle of several man-made crises. The man who is currently at the center of South Africa's crisis is a full-time businessman, animal trader, possibly a puppet of both the domestic and global capitalist interest, who has said that the job of president for him is a part-time job, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa. Let us start from the bottom. Despite many promises of universal access to early childhood development, millions of particularly black children in villages and townships have no access to early childhood development. What this means is that children of white people are born with strategic advantage and privilege over black children because white people's children start education before even 10, two years old, while black children are only given access to education at the age of five and six. And even when they go to school, these schools do not have the advanced technologies and teaching support system available for white children. This year will mark exactly 29 years since the first inclusive elections, yet we still have primary and secondary schools that use pit toilets, and we still have schools without electricity, without water, without access to basic necessities. The reality is that public education in South Africa has collapsed and has opened space for extremely expensive private schools which majority of our people cannot afford and cannot reach. In the year 2022, Almost one million students wrote their senior certificate examination metric, and yet there are less than 200,000 space, 200, spaces available in universities of technology and universities, because no one amongst those who are in government planned for the future of these students. In actual fact, there has been more than four million applications into institutions of higher learning when the spaces available are less than 200,000. Despite the former president of the ANC announcing fee-free higher education in 2019, there's still no free decolonized education in South Africa. Academically deserving yet poor students are being turned away from institutions of higher learning because of lack of money. Those who protest against fees are being shot and killed with no consequences, like Fight Amadonzela was killed at the Durban University of Technology. There is still a shortage of more than 500,000 beds for students at Tibet colleges, University of Technology and universities, and without decent and safe accommodations, students are subjected to high levels of crime, abuse, and often taken advantage of by different people. The South African government has neglected its obligation to create a safe and conducive teaching and learning environment for students. Those who sacrifice and go through endurance of finishing their students are often thrown into a very large section of the unemployed in, unemployment in South Africa. 
More than 12 million capable South Africans who are looking for jobs, including those who are discouraged, cannot find jobs anywhere because there is no meaningful program to create jobs for young people. Unemployment in South Africa is too high. And as if that is not enough, the South African Post Office has announced that it will be worsening the crisis of unemployment through retrenchment of more than 6,000 workers. The fact is that South Africa is currently the fact is that South Africa currently has closed to 20 million people who are dependent on social grant and it's not a cause for celebration, particularly when viewed from the fact that even these social grants do not eliminate poverty. There is absolutely no child and definitely no adult who can survive and thrive with 350 or 450 per month, whereas in a country with rising costs of living, not even the dogs of the presiding president survives on 450 per month. The form of social assistance provided by government since 1994 has not been impactful in reducing poverty because the current government is incapable of creating jobs and taking our people out of poverty. Landlessness is still the biggest challenge confronting our people and our attempts as the EFF to resolve the land question was undermined by the puppets of neocolonialism and imperialism. We are here today with still working under a constitution that protects the rights of stolen property because the land in the ownership and control of colonial settlers and their descendants is stolen land and no amount of lies will hide the fact that settlers are in possession of stolen goods. In the middle of lawlessness, joblessness, and many crises that define South Africa, we have high levels of crime which are perpetuated by the fact that we have an incapable and unwilling police minister who has always shown up after the crimes and only posed for cameras. This leader has demonstrated that he has got nothing to offer except to project himself as a modern day model. He is indeed a certified fool without any alternative to reducing crime in South Africa. We said before that the current leadership of the police is incapable and we are, firm, we are firmly called for the removal of some of these imposters and our cries fell on deaf ears. Let's, let's uh, le see the point of order, listen to the point of order. Or, or, uh, uh, Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The member in the podium has used an offensive language by referring to the minister as an F-O-O-N. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Malima. He didn't quote the rule, he didn't quote the rule, uh, Chair. No, it's, never mind the quoting. Uh, 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 the point is that... Uh, I can't hear you, uh, Chair. Switch on. They wrote for you. Switch on. Honorable uh, uh, please behave. I can't hear. Please behave. What I said, I can't hear. Please, please behave. I can't hear. Now, Honorable Malima, I'm calling upon you to withdraw the use of uh, an offensive, offensive, offensive. Uh, a word, and that word is full. I withdraw, Chair. Uh, thank you we very much. We have on several occasions called on the President to, re to release the clever minister who has always shown up for cameras all the time there is a crime scene with an intention of arresting wrong people and mess up the crime scene and mess up the case. Today we speak Crime has gone very high in South Africa in all respect. We don't even want to talk about GBV. We don't want to talk about cash in transit haste. We don't want to talk about contact crime because the leadership of the police is in cahoots with the criminals. The only way we can be defeated in dealing with crime is only when the leadership of the police is working with criminals. The leadership of the police works with drug lords. The leadership of the police works with incabis. The leadership of the police is in the payroll of hitmen and women of this country. The leadership of the police 
actually planned the assassination of our deputy president, a matter that we brought to the attention of the president, that the minister was involved in the plot of killing the deputy president of the EFF. This yes. is a matter that has um, been reported Honorable and Malima, has been confirmed. Honorable Malima, please take your seat. Uh, Honorable Khatebe, on what point are you rising? Chairperson, thank you, Honorable Chairperson. The member has cast aspersions on the minister without substantiating the fact. Yes. R no, Rule 12 is very clear. Rule 12 K is very clear that the rules of the NA apply in the joint city when the member of the NA is on the platform. So the member violated Rule 85 of the rules of NA. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Malima, I'm sure by now you know that if you are to make a, a, an allegation such as the one that we have, we have made now, uh, you need to have a substantive motion put in front of the House so that the matter can be uh, thoroughly debated, considered and debated. So I'm asking you again uh, to withdraw. Uh, I withdraw, I withdraw Chen. Thank you very much. When the daughter of our former Secretary General was killed, it is the police of South Africa who went to the suspect and said to the suspect, put the name of Floyd um, Shibambo, that you worked with Floyd on, Shibambo on, to Honourable assassinate. Mal, on, Honorable Malima, just a minute. Uh, Honorable Member, on what point are you rising? Thank you so much, House Chair. I'm rising on a point of privilege. House Chair, I want to address you and ask you a question on privilege. And the question is that the rule says um, when a member is kicked out of the house for the duration of the debate, that member may not continue in the same debate. Now the sauna has resuming, has not adjourned. Now the same member was kicked out of the uh, sitting in the same debate. So I want to ask you, you can come back later and make a ruling around it. The question is that, is the member per the rules allowed to continue and participate in the debate when he was moved out of the debate? I uh, thank you. Um, unfortunately, honorable member, uh, that rule is not uh, uh, applicable. Uh, uh, so the member has the right to participate in the in the proceedings, uh, but issues uh, such as the ones that we are raising can be pursued uh, in the joint rules committee uh, uh, and in other related uh, parliamentary uh, structures. Thank you very much. Please, honourable member, please proceed. Thank you very much. Um, the Deputy President of the EFF has been targeted by the leadership of the police which was willing to connive with suspects and persuaded the suspects to put the name of the Deputy President of the EFF in the murder of our former Secretary General's daughter. When they refused after being beaten, a money has been offered to them to implicate the Deputy President of the EFF in the murder of our own daughter. Why do they do this? It is only known to them. But I'm using this example to demonstrate to you that the leadership of the police is working with criminals. And for as long as the leadership of the police is working with criminals, we will never defeat crime in this country. It is the responsibility of the so-called president to remove Begitele with Honorable Begitele with immediate effect because he has failed the people of South Africa. What happened to our third artist, DJ Somebody, AKA, will never get to know because the uh, police and higher excellence of the police are in cahoots with the criminal syndicate. We cannot fight crime well led by criminals. We must first get rid of criminals in order to defeat crime. May AKA soul rest in peace and haunt all of these yes. people who have made it so difficult on, on, for him to on, live on, 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 Malima, 
Don't you really think that uh, it would be all the members, all the honorable members, all the, all the honorable members. Now, honorable members, don't you think it would, it would be uh, uh, advisable uh, that when you have to make such uh, okay. serious uh, allegations, we stick to what the rules uh, of parliament provide. In other words, that uh, you come here with a motion and the motion get debated so that indeed all the issues that you, you are related uh, get considered and, and, and engaged uh, by, by members of, 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 of parliament. Chair, I'm debating. When we, ra when we stand up during the president's speech, we are told you raise that point in debate. When we raise the point in debate, something else is being said. It means we'll never contribute in this house. I'm not saying anything against anyone. I'm just telling you the fact that we ought to fight criminality in the police. And if the shoe fit, wear it. Because it's the truth. Now you have established Minister of Electricity. We hope to see Minister of Trains. We hope to see Minister of Flights. We hope to see Minister of Dinan. We hope to see Minister of Potholes. We hope to see Minister of GBV. Because the reality is that, Mr. President, nothing is working under you. You are a man on top and doing nothing. And that is very irresponsible of a man to be on top and do nothing. The reality of the situation is that you went against the advice we gave you when you started as a president that listen to your own organization. Your own organization has now said, put the ESCOM under energy. What did you do? You went to a separate uh, kitchen cabinet and created a ministry of electricity, which doesn't derive from the resolutions of your own organization. A clear confirmation that there is a kitchen cabinet that exists in Stellenbosch and that dictates the direction this country must take. If you agree, that ESCOM has failed to discharge its responsibility. ESCOM has always had a minister, and that is a minister of public enterprise. And if we need a separate minister, it means that minister has failed. Why are you so scared to remove an incompetent minister who has failed and collapsed everything in the state -owned, under state-owned enterprise? It can be, even if you are friends, you ought to have an honest discussion amongst yourself and say, my brother, there is nothing I can do anymore. I need someone capable to come and rescue Dinel, to come and rescue Transnet, to come and rescue SAA, because ESCOM and the rest have collapsed under Honorable Praveen Gordon. I don't know Le Musabani or Honorable Praveen Gordon. I don't know if he's got a list of MPs or sellouts of during apartheid, the way you are so scared of him. But he knows in his cause that some of us are not scared of him. They've tried it before and we defeated them and will defeat them again. Fellow South Africans, nothing is working in this country. You were promised all manner of things when President Zuma was removed. Things are worse. Things will get worse because the president said that this electricity crisis is not going to be resolved in the nearest future, at least for two years. When he says two years, he means five years, or even more than that. It is up to you, South Africa, if you want to declare that enough is enough. We must make sure that on the 20th of March, we remove this puppet government from power. We must make sure that on the 20th of March, we demand the resignation of Mr. Ramaphosa. We must make sure that on the 20th of March, we demand the stopping of crime. We demand that the money launderer must be removed from office. We demand that crime in South Africa must be something of the past. If you want employment and you are sitting at home in darkness without a hope, your future is in the EFF. Join the shutdown on the 20th of March when we bring South Africa to a standstill. Only cowards who are in the pockets of capital will be scared to come to the streets on the 20th of March. 
We tried here in Parliament, they used their majority to defend criminality. We tried in the court, they used the judiciary to defend their criminality. We are left with no option. The streets are calling our names. The picket lines are calling our names. And all South Africans, we look forward to seeing you on the 20th of March, 2023. Only the fearless will be on the streets and holding this puppet government accountable. We are not scared. Only Amagwana will go and beg the president that he must not resign. But all those who know that the president did nothing for this country, including himself, will encourage him to resign because the president had already resigned. And once you have resigned and you are conv convinced by affection to stay, you must know that it is only the body that remains there. The conscience is gone because the conscience is the one that wrote a letter. No amount of factionalism can bring back that conscience. I don't know what the deputy president, the former deputy president is doing here. He allows them to use him against Paul Mashatile, but he knows that these people don't want him. They don't want you. Stop pretending that they want you. And uh, former Deputy President Didi Mabuza, please join the streets on the 20th of March Honourable Malima. Malima. Honourable Malima. All of us, please let's go on the streets on the please 20th take your seat. of March. Patria Muerte! Yeah. Patria Muerte! Patria Muerte! Please. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, honourable members, we maybe we should uh, proceed. We note that uh, when uh, when asked, we know that when asked to take the seat, Honourable Malima just ignored the presiding officer. We, we note that we note it because. We may have to follow it up. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Gwede uh, Mandash. Yeah, on what point I arise in uh, uh, Floyd, Honorable Floyd? On what point are you raising? I, I'm raising almost on the point of order. Uh, the point of order that I'm raising on is that the tradition and practice of this parliament is that as a presiding officer, when the speaker is on the platform, you only intervene when your attention is brought to violation of the rules. On several occasions, when the commander-in-chief was giving direction there, you intervene there without anyone having brought attention to any violation of the rule. And there was not even violation of any rule. So there's nothing wrong with speaking about the criminals in the police service. And he never mentioned anyone by name. Those who know, they know who that person is. But he kept on interrupting him when he was giving direction as to what must happen moving forward. That is unacceptable of you as the presiding officer today. And you must consider shifting there if you are incapable of handling this house appropriately because what they're doing is unacceptable and we'll never allow that to continue in the manner that we've been doing thus far. Uh, I must say that that is a, indeed a long speech. Uh, uh, and, and honorable members, I think we should, all of us, all of us should ensure that the business of the house is properly run and and that indeed uh, uh, as, as as presiding officers we have the overall responsibility of being fair and and running the business in such a manner uh, that no view is is seen to be to be suppressed uh, and undermined uh, but 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 uh, uh, if we are to succeed in ensuring proper decorum of the house and the dignity of, of the house, all of us must uh, take responsibility. All of us must behave 
and, 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 and work in, in a way that seeks to build and ensure that uh, we do what we are supposed to be, to be doing. Uh, so I'll, I'll proceed uh, and ask Honorable Mantashe uh, to, to deliver his address. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Amos Mosondo, uh, the Speaker of the National Assembly, uh, Honorable Nosvue Mapisa Ngakula, Deputy Speaker Lichisa Tsinudi, Deputy Chairperson of the NCOP Sylvia Lucas, uh, His Excellency, the President of the Republic, Cyril Matamara Ramaphosa, Deputy President, His Excellency, David Debede Mabuza, Honorable Ministers and Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members present here, invited guests to this gathering today. In the State of the Nation Address, President Cyril Ramaphosa identified low trending as a crisis facing our country, which is solvable. He declared it as a crisis and he said it is solvable. And he made two uh, uh, commitments to confront this crisis. The first one was to declare a state of disaster so that there should be no obstacles or limitation in addressing it. Secondly, he announced that he will appoint a Minister of Electricity in his office to focus on this crisis. Many people ask this, this, what this appointment means, and we characterize it as actually an approach that is, can be defined as project management approach uh, in dealing with the crisis. Some people in the media say, when we characterize it as a project management approach, we are reducing this ministry and its authority. Uh, I think something called school will help them understand project management as not being reductionist. Uh, all it is, it is emphasizing agency of execution and delivery uh, of the project on time. One must understand that when you talk of project management approach, you mean there will be clear time frame, the beginning and the end of the project, and you, there will be clear milestones, and there will be a clear critical path that you should not deviate from. Now, Therefore, this is not reductionist. It is communicating sense of agency and the desire to resolve this because we don't have time to wait for 24 months to resolve uh, load shedding. Uh, that is how serious the president takes this crisis. And unfortunately, we have a political parties that never want to be involved in finding solutions of any crisis. They believe that opposition means that's opposing anything that is tabled by the ANC and its government. That is a mistake. Uh, parties in Parliament should contribute to finding solutions to problems and crises. Now, in January 2023, the leader of the Democratic Alliance made a bold statement that will support declaration of the state of disaster uh, um, on the emergency and the energy crisis. That was the 31st of January. Then when the state of disaster was declared on the 9th of February, the same leader of the Democratic Alliance came back and said, we'll take the government to court for declaring a state of disaster. Now when you have the main opposition party talking from both sides of the mouth, we have a bigger crisis as a country. Now. Now, this means talking from both sides of the mouth, Honorable Steinhausen, is not helpful to society. The DA must throw ideas. We use those ideas to get solutions. I don't want to refer to the EFF and ATM, Honorable Malema, because you opted out of the State of the Nation address. Went left and you are not here. You opted out. Now, even now, now you know EFF, 
even does something very, very unthinkable. In a country where a prime minister was assassinated in the House of Parliament, they, they stormed the stage. It's unthinkable. Now, now, no, but I, I'm leaving this, I'm leaving this to the president to finalize. I'm leaving the criminal aspect to the, to the minister of police to connect. I refer to a crisis that is solvable because there are immediate actions that government can take in addressing the short term and the medium term. This includes improving ESCOM's energy availability factor uh, through maintenance and servicing existing power stations. That means the current coal power station must operate optimally. We procure emergency uh, power, we purchase electricity from neighboring countries, and we improve skills capacity of the office of And that, those four interventions will help us, that they will help us focus. Honorable uh, uh, Man Mandash, just a minute. Urban Josie, on, on what point are you standing? A point of order. Yes, okay. Let's hear uh, it. Honorable Mandash says his prime minister was assassinated. And I know only of one prime minister, that's Fervut. Are you saying no, Fervut was your no, minister? No, I didn't say that. I've been very suspicious that you were part of apartheid. <laughs> well, uh, well. Apartheid. Honorable You just confirmed calling Fervut your prime minister. Honorable Urban Dozi, that's not a point of order. I'm sure you know that. Honorable uh, members, can I make a plea once again? Please do not abuse the point of order and give us speeches and so on. Please, please don't do that. Uh, proceed, uh, Minister. Thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. So our main focus on improving electricity availability factor should focus on the following power stations. If you look at a power station like Tutuga, which is having EAF of 33.3%, Kendall 45.5 percent, Dover 20.7 percent, Majuba 44.3 percent, Kusile 24.7, and Maka 42.8. Those six power stations deprive the country of more than 50 percent of availability factor, and therefore this focus minister will have to focus on those power stations to give us energy and resolve. Uh, load shedding. The government continues to develop generation capacity because generation capacity, as we develop it, we are focusing on the long term sustainable energy security of supply. And that's why, for example, we must be reminded that 2,200 and 500 megawatts uh, of renewable energy was procured under bid window 4 on which we are, we are 2,120 and 30 megawatts are connected to the grid, providing us with much needed electricity. 2,583 megawatts uh, have been procured under bid window five, with 1,759 megawatts uh, are under construction. Under bid window six, we procured 4,200 megawatts. Only 1,000 could be declared because of the grid problem. So as we deal with the problem of the current coal generators, we must equally urgently deal with uh, strengthening of the transmission. So my submission, therefore, is that this minister, who is appointed to focus on electricity, which is not a something strange, by the way. Egypt has a Minister of Electricity. Bahrain has, Kuwait has, uh, uh, New Zealand had for a long period of time. It has stopped that now. And so it's not something new. Let's focus on providing electricity in the country. Let me, let me explain that as a department, Mineral Resources and Energy, we issue RFPs were uh, very soon on 513 megawatts battery storage, 3,000 megawatts on, uh, on gas, 
and we're going to issue bid window seven, which is going to go up to 5,000 megawatts. Let me leave energy and use the remaining five minutes on mining. South African mining sector contributes 8% to the gross domestic product, and we are aiming it to contribute 12%. This low performance largely attributed to global increase of energy prices because of the continued geopolitical dynamics, the ongoing power disruptions, which is low trading, logistic bottlenecks on our rail and ports, and crime. Now, as a result, mineral production contracted by 9% in 2022. And that contraction was actually uh, backed as a trend by one company called Coalfields because much earlier it applied to establish its own solar uh, plant to substitute ESCOM energy in some terms. That's why Coalfields grew by 10%. So that is a pointer to a number of minds that if you take initiative, you take the initiative, you will save the economy. And again, I think it is quite important that NERSA has approved registration of 406 megawatts, uh, and at the total of this register generation is 1,664 megawatts uh, among the generators is Seriti, which is a mining company, which should begin the construction of 155 megawatts uh, with a project in, Namag uh, in Pumalanga and Exaro will construct 70 megawatts, 70 of solar plant. And that is a trend that mining companies are following to mitigate the crisis of load shedding. We welcome the establishment of a joint structure between Transnet and the Mineral Council South Africa to accelerate improvement of our rail and port infrastructure because those bottlenecks deprive South Africa of taking advantage of good prices of commodities and leave the, the, the high demand, which is not permanent. And therefore, it is important for us to attend to these problems. And I must say, uh, there was a lot of interest shown by investors in the exploration in 2023 mining in Daba. And if we pay and invest enough in exploration, mining has a future. That's where it all begins. And we will work in this interest so that these investments are realized. Furthermore, there is an interest in minerals of the future, which will include your lithium, which we have discovered massive deposits in the free state of uh, rare earth minerals in the Northern Cape copper, nickel, and many others. And these minerals, which, are our, which our country is endowed with, are essential for the development of low-carbon economy that we're looking forward to. The GMRE is also seized with addressing the backlog of prospecting and mining applications. We have reduced that backlog by 42% over the last 18 months. The procurement of the customer's cadastral system is also quite important it's underway, and I will hope that by end of February this year, end of this month, it will be out and we'll be having it sooner. Let me conclude by expressing our appreciation following the reduction of mining industry fatalities. I know very few people pay attention to this. Actually, 2022 registered the lowest number of fatalities in the mining industry in history. 49 is the number. Now, in a country that has been full of disasters, you can look into the Colbrook disaster, 435 workers die in one day. Your Kindos disaster, 177 miners die. Your Valrif disaster, your Sandalina disaster. When you reduce fatality in the mining industry to 49, is a progress towards zero harm in the sector. I must also put the point that this is an improvement to a record that was set in 2019 of 51 fatalities. Over the last three years, uh, we never registered any disaster. Our definition of a disaster is when one accident uh, actually kills five or more people. So over the last four years, we have not had a disaster in the mining industry. And therefore, the improvement is worth acknowledging, but every life 
lost is one life more. So we should not kill mine workers. Mine workers must go to work, come back alive, and be, be themselves. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Thank you very much, Minister. We'll now proceed to Honorable Singh. Honorable uh, Chairperson of the NCOP, Honorable Speaker, Honorable President, Honorable Members, let me start off by apologizing on behalf of Prince Mangasudu Butulezi, Honorable Member, who says while he cannot physically be in Cape Town, he knows that his contribution to this debate, read by the IFP's Chief Whip, will nevertheless express the voice of South Africans from all corners of our country. We may not all be at City Hall, but we are part of this conversation. Honorable Chairperson, he says, when he was a student at the University of Fort Hare, the President of the Student Representative Council, Mr. Robert Mangaliswe Sobukwe, delivered a speech that he has never forgotten, and I quote, Mr. Sabukwa quoted the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, who declared the urgency of universal emancipation. He said, and I quote, I am aware that many object to the severity of my language, but is there not cause for severity? Tell a man whose house is on fire to give a moderate alarm. Tell him to moderately rescue his wife from the hands of the ravisher. Tell the mother to gradually extricate her babe from the fire into which it has fallen. But urge me not to use moderation in a cause like the present. I will not equivocate, I will not excuse." Close quotes. Honorable President, after a man has lost his house, there is no glory in arriving with a bucket of water and saying, better late than never. And there is no kindness in telling a grieving mother or a victim of gender-based violence that, quote, we cannot undo the mistakes of the past, close quote. There is such a thing as too little, too late. Even if this government were to wake up now and do its job, there is no guarantee it will be enough to claw our country back from disaster. Just as the calamity of our past demanded a severe, unequivocal and urgent response, so too does the calamity of the present. Let us not delude ourselves that South Africa can survive a government that has made promises, reneged on promises, made plans, gone back on plans, changed direction, moved backwards and stood still, all while our country is burning. Honorable Chairperson, in paying tribute to the Honorable Dr. Frini Jenwala last week, we remembered the first years of our democratic parliament and the constitutional assembly in which we hammered out the blueprint for the country we sought. Having led the constitutional assembly, you will remember, Honorable President, becoming exasperated with your own party and telling them, and I quote what you said, Honorable President, at least the IFP knows what it wants, close quote. Right at the foundations of our democracy, the IFP produced a detailed analysis of what was needed, evaluating all the alternatives, pointing to the right path, and explaining why it was the best course of action. Had our government been as single-minded, committed, and, com and competent as the IFP over the past 29 years, I have no doubt the lights would be on. Your Excellency, you have told us that South Africa is defined by hope and resilience. But if you ask anyone on the street what defines us, they would say load shedding, unemployment, and crime, amongst other things. You are right that we are not people easily resigned to our fate. But there is a warning in that. How long will it be before you have a revolution on your hands? And believe me, it will not be a silent revolution. Honorable President, we were all, uh, Honorable Chairperson, we were all disgusted by the disturbances on Thursday night during Sona. And as we walked out and as we met people on the street, 
they refer to this institution, this parliament, your parliament, Madam Speaker and Honorable Chairperson, as a circus ground. And this doesn't bode well for us as an institution. Just last week, the threats and insults and disruptive behavior evolved into falsely implicating the Minister of Police in a fictional assassination plot. Our people are tired of unfounded allegations and something must be done about that. <laughs> Honorable Chairperson, when it comes down to it, South Africans what South Africans want is solutions. We want honesty. We want fairness and justice and to know that our government is capable and willing to do its job. It is thus worrying to hear you say, Honorable President, that you have discovered a lack of technical skills and management skills across government. We have been warning for years that cadre deployment at the cost of skills deployment, employment would have its effect. You now talk about rebuilding skills that have been lost over time. This did not happen by chance. Skills were pushed out in favor of giving jobs to pals. Can we really believe, Honorable Chairperson, that that gravy train will stop? Corruption has become so embedded in the culture of the civil service that it will take much more than words to change it. We have had to spend over a billion run on an inquiry into state capture. We all saw the abuse of public funds that emerged under the last national state of disaster. We are not talking about one or two bad apples. There is a pervasive rot that needs to be dealt with, Honorable President. This is why our citizens no longer hear the echoes of Nelson Mandela when you say, to work together. The appointing of a Minister of Electricity in the Presidency is another way of saying that our Minister of Public Enterprises and our Minister of Minerals and Energy have failed. This bloating of bureaucracy is not a solution. As the IFP's President so aptly asked, why not have a Minister of Potholes in the Presidency? And a Special Minister of Education and a Special Minister of Inequality Mr. President, what we need is people with the requisite skills, unbeholden to political masters, who reap no side benefits, and who genuinely seek what is best for South Africa. In the absence of this, and in the absence of clear-cut strategies, with firm timelines and deliverables for investors, business, and consumers, our fragile economy may well break. We do have experts, Honorable President, and brilliant minds in South Africa. Why are we not listening to them? And some of them have left our country. Let's bring them back. I met a young man last week who, who qualified at UKZN, went abroad to Cambridge, did masters, did a PhD, expert on electricity issues, wants to come back and help the country, wrote to somebody in the department, no response. Honorable President, we also need to look ahead and train the next generation of skilled experts. You will remember that during our liberation struggle, when all across South African schools were being burned down and classrooms abandoned under the banner, liberation first, education later, Inkata declared education for liberation. In KwaZulu, we invested heavily in quality of education for the oppressed, providing the tools to shape the future and preparing the next generation to competently engage with the changed world. There is something very wrong, Mr. Chairperson, when we talk about an 80% metric pass rate, when at the same time, 80% of grade four learners are unable to read for meaning. What happened in between was not a miraculous intervention, but an excessively high rate of dropouts. And what happens for that generation of dropouts? How do they find jobs and survive and make their contribution to our beloved country? 
Yes, Honorable President, the main issue is electricity. But just because that is the crisis of today does not mean that every other crisis can be placed on hold. There are communities that have not had water for months and even years. There are people losing their homes and businesses to our struggling economy. There are, as you say, people who call 10 when their lives are in imminent danger and no one answers the phone. Honorable Chairperson, last year I questioned the suspension of the presidential employment stimulus vouchers to subsistence farmers because of poor implementation. In October last year, the presidency announced that 142,000 vouchers had been issued. Some four months later, the figure has decreased to 140,000, yet government promises to provide 250,000 more this year. It is very difficult to believe the new promises being made when old promises remain unfulfilled. Honorable President, in his first State of the Nation address to a democratic South Africa, President Nelson Mandela said, the government I have the honor to lead is inspired by the single vision of creating a people-centered society to the pursuit of the goals of freedom from want, freedom from hunger, freedom from deprivation, freedom from ignorance, freedom from suppression, and freedom from fear. Close quote. Almost three decades later, that vision has disappeared. If the promise of South Africa is truly alive, it is thanks to the resilience of our people. But how far is this government willing to test our resilience? We are playing a dangerous game if we do not address the concerns of South Africans. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now proceed to Honorable uh, P.J. Kunewald. Geachte voorzitter, through you to the Honorable President. Honorable President, in your 8 January address, you and the ANC thought it well to play the race card. What you did, you took two young men in terms of the Marshall Sports incident and you said that you condemn racism. I predict that in the coming election, the race card is going to be played a couple of times. And Honorable President, you condemned racism. But the court case hasn't been finalized yet on that matter. Now I want to put it very clearly. The Freedom Front Plus condemns any form of racism. But there's a difference in the condemnation of racism between the ANC and the Freedom Front Plus. Honorable President, you only see racism as white on black racism. There was a court case about two black police men and the court found that a white woman, a colonel, was the victim of racism of these two men. So there is also black on white racism. And you said, Honorable President, that there's no place for racists in South Africa. They must leave the country. Honorable President, I request you, please ask these two black men who are racist to leave the country. Ons kan nie een nasie bou as ons eenzijdig net dier een eenoogige perspektief te kyk na racisme. Etaak, in terme van artikel 83c van die grondwet, is om eenheid te bou in Suid-Afrika en die Suid-Afrikaanse nasie. Jy sal dit net kan doen as jy ook swart op wit rasisme kan veroordeel. Honorable Groenewal, just a minute. Uh, I see there's a hand at the back there. On what point are you rising, member? Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. I was just saying, we don't have the, the headphones uh, for interpretation. Okay. So, Honorable Groenewal, when he goes deep, we can hear. Yeah, no. Um, the table must look at that. Yes. 
uh, uh, please look at the, the situation, the uh, interpretation. Please proceed, Honorable Kronewald. Honorable Kronewald, please pro proceed whilst we're sorting out uh, the interpretation. Yeah, please. The member can come, I'll explain to him after the Akbar uh, President, what we say is that we can not double standard in South Africa. Nie. The Freiheitsfront Plus verwerp enige vorm van racisme. En daarom moet u als president die voorbeeld stellen in termen van artikel 83c van die grondwet om nazi te bouwen. En ons moet niet die rassenkaart wil spelen. Honorable president, as far as ESCOM is concerned, I first want to ask you, you're going to appoint a minister for electricity. How many cadres do you need to change the bulb? Want to hold the ladder? Want to get on the ladder? Want to pass on the bulb? And if they put it in, there's no electricity. You own minister for energy and mineral resources said it's only going to be a project manager. Those words should say something to you because that minister doesn't see the new minister as an equal, only a project manager. Honorable President, it is common knowledge that black economic empowerment and affirmative action is one of the main reasons for the problems in ESCO. Their own employment equity plan determines that in the next three years, ESCO must get rid of 500 white men technicians with technical skills. Honorable President, I've urged you many times from this podium, let us get rid of black economic empowerment and affirmative action because it's nothing else than the smokescreen for corruption. And even the Zondo Commission found so. The people of South Africa and specifically the white people, and I said it many times, wants to build South Africa. Honorable President, are you aware of the fact that the Mr. Yapi van Seyl, he studied at Stellenbosch, he was a member of the South African Navy, he's an engineer. Unfortunately, he passed away in 2020. But Yapi van Seyl was the project manager for perseverance on Mars. Are you aware of the fact that on the planet Mars there is a mountain range named Yapi van Seyl? That's acknowledgement for people from South Africa, irrespective of race. Honorable Chairperson, you said that we must take joint responsibility for ESCO. I want to put it very clearly. The Freedom Front Plus doesn't take responsibility for the crisis of ESCO. Yes, we have solutions. But Honorable President, and I will submit you with a 10-point plan of the Freedom Front Plus to solve the problem and the crisis. But the question is whether you're going to read it. Do you listen what opposition party leaders say to you? I don't experience that, unfortunately. So we do not take responsibility for the crisis. I also want to say, Honorable President, that you were put in charge in 2015 of the war room that was created by your predecessor. And a couple of things had been said and I want to quote. On the 2nd of September 2015, you yourself said the following, in the next 18 months to two years, you will forget that the challenges we had with power, energy and ESCOM ever existed. Close quote. On the 3rd of April 2019, the Honourable Minister Pravin Gordon said the following, ESCOM aims to assure, ensure that there will be no more load shedding from 3 April 2019. The same Honourable Gordon 
said the other day, in fact, the 25th of January, on an online symposium with the University of Johannesburg, he said, We are now in the mood to urgently solve the crisis as soon as possible. Close quote. In the mood? Honorable Chairperson? Maybe the Honorable Minister must visit the people on the streets and determine their mood when there is load shedding. And I can assure you, he will be surprised because he doesn't know what is load shedding because no minister gets load shedding. And I think it is arrogant, I think it is arrogant to say we are now in the mood. So for solving the problem depends on the mood. Honorable President, I want to continue. There are simple steps that can be taken. For instance, ESCOM applied for a permit to get fuel much cheaper, but the Minister for Energy rejected it. There is an ongoing case between ESCOM and the revenue services in terms of a rebate on fuel. Why don't you solve it? Why go to court? It's simple steps that can be taken. Honorable Chair, I also want to read to you, because we had our own survey amongst people, how they experience load shedding. And in our survey, we found that Mr. Maria Libber is the owner of a small fuel station in Tromsberg in Kopanong, in the Free State. His overheads increased with almost 40,000 rand during January this year. The cost of fuel for a power generator. This threatens the continued existence of that business and the livelihoods of his staff members. Businesses in agriculture value chain in Frankfurt, Mafube, in the Free States, or spending as much as 22,000 rand per day on fuel for generators. Meneer Zerik van der Merwe van Pretoria had ons laat weet dat hy noodgedwonge 4 miljoen rand moes bestee aan alternatieve energiebronne om sy vervoer onderneming aan die gang te hou. Those are the suffering of the people who have load shedding. Honorable President, with my time, I want to say crime in South Africa is out of control. When you became the president, you wanted to be Madiba too. Let me say this to you. Take a leaf from the book of Madiba. Because Madiba appointed a person, Andre Pinar, in terms of a strategy for crime, specifically organized crime. They come up with the idea of the scorpions. It's time we go back to that. To solve specifically transnational crime and where kidnapping is a lucrative crime of today. Honorable President, the problem, and there are many problems, is the expropriation bill. The expropriation bill is nothing else than expropriation without compensation. I request you, before you sign, please send it to the Constitutional Court. I conclude. Honorable President, the people who created a crisis cannot be the people to solve that crisis. There is only one way to solve all the crises in South Africa, and that is in next year's election, we must get rid of the ANC government. I thank you. Thank you very much. We we'll now proceed to the Minister of Police. The Honourable Chairperson, Honourable Speaker, His Excellency the President, Deputy President, Colleagues, the ministers, deputy ministers, ladies and gentlemen, good morning, San Bonani to Milan.
Wednesday, before the sauna, I had a long, mini, long meeting with the deputy secretary of the EFF in my house. A very long meeting with him. He was there to urge me and beg me to confirm that I have said IFP will kill him. And when I refused, he promised me that life is going to be difficult for me. So, <laughs> so uh, yes, Deputy, yes, Secretary General, yes. So, President of the FF, you were lied to. You must be angry, but not with me. It's not me who lied to you to put you to come on the national TV to tell the world the wrong thing. It wasn't me. You go and correct it with your SG. I spent 47 minutes with him. And then I refused. Mr. President, that's the only reason. Maybe there are three more other reasons. Minister, just a minute. Minister, just a minute. Yes, uh, Moran, on that point are you rising? No, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Let me address this coward of the ANC. So, the question that you should be responding to, did you not call me on Saturday? Last week, Saturday, he called me, not... He's the one who called me, not the other way around. And his call was very clear. SG has uh, uh, detected political uh, intolerance in case again that is going to lead to killings. Honorable and member. My question to him was that Minister, does it involve me? And his answer was yes. Hon and he member. proposed that let us meet in Cape Town on Wednesday. Honorable so member. he's scared of IFP. He must not use my name. He is a coward. He's scared of IFP. Honorable member. Not the other way around. Honorable member, that's not a point of it's order. It's a point of order. I'm addressing the coward. Please, please. I'm not scared of him or anyone. Please else. take your seat. So if he's scared of IFP, that's his problem. Please take your seat. Yeah, if he's but if he's scared of IFP, he must not bring the beauty down. He's the one who called me this coward. Please. Minister, please proceed. Well, I didn't, have, I didn't have the drink and juice to give it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, but the meeting was quite long, 47 minutes. I'm sorry that you didn't give it anything to drink. <laughs> Having said so, the second point on this one, I, I, will, I will request the president of the FF to repeat every word outside of the president of the FF to repeat every word outside of And now he is responding to issues that I was not given an opportunity to speak to because you said I must withdraw. This is an abuse of this house. But unlike him, I've said this in public and I will say it again. I'm not scared of that. I brought it to his attention when the crime intelligence went to implicate Floyd in Hillary's murder. I told him that they said the crime intelligence is saying the uh, suspects must implicate Floyd. And I told even the president about him being involved on the possible assassination of Floyd. He knows that and I will repeat it in public. Thank you very much. Honorable members, honorable members, order, honorable members, order, honorable members.
Please take your seats. Thank you very much. Please, please, please. Ja. Honorable Minister, just a minute. Honorable, just a, Honorable Minister, just a second, please. Just a second, please. Just a second. Honorable members, the rule, the rule. The rules, please sit, sit down, honorable member. Please sit down. Please sit down. No member can take the floor and speak unless a presiding officer says so. So please sit down. Please sit down. Please take your seat. Honorable member, please take your seat. Honorable members, can I once again make this plea? Let us please stop from using point of orders to make speeches. Let us please stop using point of orders to make speeches. Uh, Minister, please proceed. Thank you very much. The third point on this one, I will never allow the South African Police Service to be another Apollo Gwane where we will milk it down and make sure that it dies. I'll never allow that to happen. That will take care of it and we'll make sure that we stay far to don't come to run the totalization. Third point, there is one thing common about you and me, so Babil Sakutsu Aokoko. But my grandma told me one thing, that when a pig takes your banana and runs to the pig stand, don't follow it. Allow the pig to swim alone in that muddy stand. Receive my safety and security greeting this morning on behalf of the selfless men and women in blue who are the cold face of responding to gruesome crime scenes on a daily basis. By the way, the president of the FF is the only person that has called the police to be attacked in their houses. May they call that attack their wives attack their children, attack them. Maybe that's why police are killed. I've never had that being withdrawn. Maybe that's why today we're in trouble. Dedicated detectives who continue to solve complicated cases and further secure significant life sentences in the camp of violent crime. And in the name of the fallen heroes who are killed in the line of duty while serving and protecting fellow South Africans. Honorable members, I wish to anchor this debate on the wise words of late civil rights activist John Lewis. During a trying time and difficult, he reminded Americans and humanity as a whole of their collective responsibility and power when he said, I quote, when you see something that is not right, not fair, not just, we have to speak up, we have to stay, you have to say something, we have to, and you have to do something, close quotes. Allow me to use these words to emphasize the importance of the community-centered approach in the over, overall and overwriting and overarching over fighting against crime. If communities can do justice to what Lewis argues, then police and communities can eventually realize the vision of halving violent crime in our country in the prescribed time. If the community members of Kwazakel, Gwamash, Kailish, Soweto, Kuklet, Market, and the criminal underworld syndicates can speak up and do something, then the results will show. We are also making a clarion call to other sections of society, be it the academia, business, the clergy, the media, 
and the organized groupings don't be spectators, join the fight against crime. I will have to remind that today is a 10th year since the murder of young girl that was killed by his boyfriend. She did not die alone. There are others that are still dying today. The name is Rina Stenka. That's, that's Rina Stenka who was killed. And there are other young ladies that are still killed today. Karabo Mkwena, Jennifer Mshomi, Tsako Fero Pule, Ntoko Zukaba, and Nostelo Mtembe Niklio Tiko. I want, to, I want to make a call today, a clarion call especially to women, especially to DA women, that as we see these problems of gender-based violence, they could not have allowed their leader to say the statement that she said about her, his ex-wife. Yes, he called her an, a flat chicken. He called her a road kid. A road kill is an animal. A road kill is an animal that you kill and you don't care. For the leader to raise that statement and the women don't say anything is a serious document. So I'm making a clear on call to speak to you, to speak to your leader, to say he cannot be ready to lead this country when he still look at women as a road kill when he calls women as flat chickens. So I'm making that clear on call. So we have responded. We thank the president very much that he has responded to the crime to strengthen the police by giving us 10,000 members of the South African police that we trained last year and we are also training 10,000 this year and that will help to the visibility of police but also it will help us to give us a pool to train the special units to be able to respond to the crime and different times, different kinds of crime that are happening in South Africa. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that we are not responding at the present time. There are many people that have been arrested, especially in the infrastructure mafia, including those that we have arrested come as the problem as the problem as, as the problem of escort. We are continuing to pull those things together. Last year alone, we have arrested 4,909 people that have committed have committed gender-based violence, almost 200 of them in the last 12 months alone. 189 of them have been given life sentence. We are agreed that we do need to deal with the issue of illegal firearms. It is on the score that at least 65,952 firearms illegal have been destroyed in the previous year. We will continue to hunt these guns. We will continue to strengthen the law that people must be safe when we collect these illegal firearms. But to South Africa, let's come together, let's work together in dealing especially with the gender-based violence. That invitation also goes to the Honorable Mr. Steinhazen to say, Mr. Steinhazen, we want to hear you apologizing apologizing to abuse a young woman who came to work in your office and was a wife of your colleague and you took that wife of your colleague you divorced your own wife and you took that young you took that young girl she's your wife today but the women around you are quiet are not saying anything and you come in this podium 
You talk about gender-based violence. So you better go Minister. and fix yourself. Minister. If not, we'll help you. Minister. Thank you very much, everybody. Minister, please uh, take your seat. Yeah, uh, Honorable Mente. I'm recognizing Honorable Men. I recognize Honorable Men, but it does seem as if Honorable Malima uh, Thank you, Thank you, Chair. Wants, wants to speak. Yeah. Thank you very much. We really cannot, with you, Chair, sitting there allow a situation where the minister drags a wife of the leader of the opposition and she's not here now you can do the nonsense you are doing because when we're starting to respond we are going to be in the wrong we shouldn't use the women to fight our own political battles here to a point where allegations that cannot be confirmed are being said here and you allow that to happen. That degeneration, honorable chair, happened previously and when we responded, you were the complainants. We cannot sit here and allow the minister to abuse the wife of the leader of the opposition in the name of fighting GPV. That is a woman abuse what he did here and cannot be accepted. He must be called to order and to withdraw that unconditionally. Honorable members, honorable, honorable members, I have warned you continuously and have called and have called on you not to raise allegations and matters that would require us to, as members to come forward with the motion, substantive motions. I've asked you over and over again. But more importantly, more importantly, I've warned you against the use of offensive language so I'm, I'm pleading with you I'm pleading with you that if we want this house to manage its business in a way that is productive in a way that ensures dignity of the house in a way that ensures that the decorum of the house is maintained all of us must cooperate. The issue that has been raised by the minister will be pursued. Uh, will be pursued. Um, uh, for now, we will proceed and have uh, uh, we will we'll proceed and have the the honourable uh, Western Cape Premier. Uh, please proceed. Honourable Chairperson of this August House, Mr. President, Leader of the Opposition, Honourable Members of this National Assembly, it is actually a privilege to be able to be part of this debate, but I must say that this debate on the state of our nation is at a critical time. Our nation is actually in a disaster. Not only a declaration of disaster, but so many components of our society are absolutely in a state of disaster. I'm only going to focus on two things in this debate. I want to focus on the energy crisis. And I'm going to start off by Honorable Minister and the Presidency putting some numbers on the table, some facts. You called for the facts. 
It has been over 5,500 days since South Africa first experienced rolling blackouts in our country. It has been almost 3,000 days since the then Deputy President, the now President Cyril Ramaphosa, was made responsible for the ESCOM war room. Nearly 3,000 days, remember that number. It has been over 200 days since the President, Cyril Ramaphosa, addressed the nation with his crisis interventions after three weeks of the worst load shedding and power cuts that we had ever experienced. This was on the 25th of July last year, more than 200 days ago. We have had 167 days of power cuts since September 2022, only two days without rolling blackouts across our country. As the leader of the opposition says, more than 1,000 hours of load shedding in our country. And our response, we already have three ministers who are responsible in one way or another to make sure that we fix this problem. We have now the announcement of a new Minister of Energy. And then we declare a disaster, which brings another minister in play. So now we have four ministers responsible for fixing this problem, and we put another minister of disasters on top of those four ministers and say, you must now go and fix this problem. I say to this House, that this is an imperial presidency. This is political rhetoric. It is about lavish spending, no detail, and contradictory information on sorting out this absolutely disastrous problem that every citizen of our country is facing. Do you know that we cannot get real clarity on real detail of where we are with this disaster. I have attended many meetings and I will tell you about that clarity because the same minister says we want the facts. I'll tell you one fact. Since the minister, no, since the then uh, president called that disaster committee over 200 days ago, we have not seen one more megawatt come into our energy system. Not one. That's a fact. There have actually been less megawatts in our system since that meeting was called on the 25th of July, 2022. And when I say we need clarity, I've actually written to the President because the clarity is so glaringly missing. If you go to the PCC, and you see what is said there where they say up to 8,822 megawatts will be brought in this year into our energy provision. I'll say that again, 8,822. But when you start interrogating the 2023 8,822 megawatts, the first thing that comes into that mix is 1,621 megawatts from our neighboring countries. Don't we sell power to our neighboring countries? Are we going to send it to them and then get it back? So far, we're hearing that it's not 1,625, but it's maybe 300. Let's talk about the Kusile component of that 8,800 megawatts. That's 2,880 megawatts. The 2,880 megawatts comes from Unit 1, 2, and 3 of Kusile plus Unit 5. Now, if you know anything about Kusile, you'll know Unit 5 is only coming online next year. And when it comes on, it's got to be trialed first. So that's not this year. That's next year. We also know that Unit 1, 2, and 3, and I didn't get this from my letter to the President. I got this from my own meetings, myself going to look for myself, to find out for myself. Those three flues, of which the one is totally collapsed, are filled with a build-up inside, one could call it sometimes up to 
60 centimeters thick. To solve that problem is at least, from the professionals, 10 months. At least, that takes us to the end of the year. How on earth are we going to get those three units back in? So every single detail that's been put on the table is rubbish. How are we supposed to work with that, Mr. President? I also want to say that the urgency that we're hearing now is way too late. Way, way too late. Can I also say to you that now five days after the SONA and declaring a disaster to sort out this emergency of power production in our country, we have not seen the regulations yet. And that is actually where the problems lie. If we don't get the regulations right, the whole thing will fail. But I can also say to you that this province will play its part. We've already started putting forward our comments on the regulations. I also want to say one other thing that was said from this podium today about how we're going to solve this problem. We spoke about the ESCOM debt. Here's a fact, Minister. The fact is we are going to take that debt and remove it from ESCOM, so-called write it off. And what will we do? We'll add that debt back on to the debt carried by the citizens and the taxpayers of this country. So those that are paying their electricity are now going to have to pay the debt of everyone else who hasn't paid their electricity. That is totally unacceptable. That's a fact, Minister. Where is the urgency, I ask? to the government of this country. You know that on the 24th of February last year, almost a year ago, there was some colonization taking place in the Northern Hemisphere. The Russian government invaded the Ukraine nearly a year ago. And what was the consequence of that illegal war? The consequence was an energy crisis in another part of the world, in Europe. Because Russia provides gas to much of Europe. Europe knew that there was an energy crisis on the way. So 200 days after the president announced this action plan, not one megawatt extra. In Germany, when they knew that 17% of their energy production is going to be at risk, because they were not going to get Russian gas, they built a brand new gasification system. That took 192 days, done and dusted, ready to operate. 192 days, less time than it took between the announcement by the president and not one minute. The Dutch went better than that. They also had the same risk in energy, and they took 160 days to create their own gasification import systems so that they could mitigate their energy risks going into their winter. 160 days. And we are sitting at 200 days and not even one megawatt. As you conclude, honorable member. <laughs> I now need to conclude, and I haven't even spoken about safety or murder. Do you know, Chair, that that wasn't mentioned by the president. The 30, the 18.7 percent increase in murder in the Eastern Cape of 4,407 people last year, the 5,570 people murdered in Gauteng, the 6,495 people murdered in your, KZD, your time is up. and the 4,109 people murdered in this province. That minister never said a word about it, and neither did that president, and that minister must go. So must this ANC government. No, thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Honorable Olomisa. Uh, our chairperson, Honorable President, Deputy President, 
Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members. Mr. President, the UDM believes that the people you should have relied on to implement your plans and strategies are not only your cabinet members. The technocrats in government, in particular accounting officers, have been sidelined for years and those responsible for oversight have overstepped their boundaries for far too long. This makes government ineffective. Mr. President, I would like to touch upon three issues that South Africans have raised with the UDM. One, uh, issue one is concerns the pensions of those who were employed in the SA TBVC states in 1970 and 80s. These people made a considerable con uh, contribution, totaling billions to the pensions that were inherited by GEPF, that is now managed by the PIC. Their concerns center around the calculation of their pensions, which had an effective date starting in 1996. They feel that there is a major error in how their pensions are being calculated. They have raised these concerns with the PIC, GEPF, and the Ombuds Office of the Pensions to no avail, and there is much unhappiness regarding this issue. As a result, they find themselves in court with their limited resources. The UDM would suggest that government must appoint a team of experts to clear out this crisis and that they work with pensioners' organizations who represented this group. Some people have in the meantime passed away waiting for a solution. Therefore, please, Mr. President, let this problem be solved once and for all. The other one is uh, the issue of uh, military veterans, Mr. President. The military veterans' pensions, regulations, and benefits as recently proposed by the Minister of Defense has also been a bone of contention. Through these regulations, XMK and X, by extension rather, X APLA veterans are being elevated above their military pen, uh, pensioners, rather above other military pensioners, and thus violates the Military Veterans Act of 2011. We must remind ourselves that there was no outright winner between black and white, militarily speaking, in the armed struggle. We agreed to all to sit down around the table and broker peace. So no one can claim to, can claim the right to dictate the rules and regulations against others. We ask the President to ask the Minister of Defense not to go ahead with these regulations which are contradictory to the Act and the spirit of the integration or integrated armed forces. This behavior will affect the morale of the serving men and women and those who are retired. It is a fact that we must thank the opposition parties in this country for playing a meaningful role in affecting change in South Africa. The ruling party outright rejected former public protectors Tulima Donzela state capture findings. The pressure exerted by the opposition benches led to the establishment of the Zondo Commission, which showed in no uncertain terms how state resources have been misused. For example, the country has been delivered into the grips of load shedding, whilst corruption has showed all the money that was meant to develop the power generating infrastructure of South Africa. Certainly, Mr. President, the ruling party uh, on this one, through Hitachi and Chancellor House deals. And I wish to remind you, Mr. President, you have considered that where corruption is concerned, the ruling party is accused, number one. Lastly, the Zondo Commission's report has been generating dust here in Parliament. We would prefer that the leader of government business 
uh, in Parliament must monitor the process and the implementation of the Zondo Commission's findings. He should also advise as to how the other serious evidence slipped through the Commission's processes and how the veracity of, of that evidence be uh, tested. It would, however, be a mistake to wait for the current speaker to drive the debate as she is conflicted. The Bosasa offshoot company, Yambu Holdings, which she was part as of, received conclude, uh, millions and millions of rents in tenders from the state. Bosasa, as we all know, was cited in the commission. So, Agana Wikopela le Ewa party ayo Thank you very much. We will now proceed on the bank. Honourable members, last year the National Assembly had the chance to amend the Disaster Management Act to prevent the further abuse of government power under a national state of disaster. At the time, the government's monumental mishandling of the COVID-19 pandemic was still fresh in the minds of ordinary South Africans. The mismanagement, the corruption, the shutdown of entire industries that was in defiance of evidence at the time. Talk about not leaving anybody behind. Millions of South Africans were left behind and are still behind because of the last national state of disaster. The lockdown taught us that the Disaster Management Act, as it stands, has got serious constitutional defects, making it a dangerous weapon in the hands of incompetent ministers who only care about command and control. Section 27 gives one cabinet minister the power to invoke a national state of disaster, and this gives that minister, presently the Honorable Dlamini Zuma, extraordinary powers to make and break laws. There's no requirement that a declaration of this nature should be tabled or debated in Parliament. Parliament cannot amend regulations issued under a national state of disaster or veto them. And this decree of a national state of disaster can be rolled over again and again and again by the stroke of a ministerial pen so that, so that in theory, this country can be governed under a perpetual national state of disaster. This is why the DA is challenging Section 27 of the Disaster Management Act. But had the ANC and the majority in Parliament not blocked that amendment to the Disaster Management uh, uh, Act last year, Parliament could have solved the problem by its own initiative. At the time, the DA sounded the following warning that the government's handling of COVID-19 was worse because it had too much power. And the same was going to be true of the next disaster. And so here we are again. In the ordinary sense of the word, the, the electricity crisis in South Africa and our reliance on ESCOM is a disaster. It is an ANC-sponsored disaster. The cumulative effect of decades of cadre deployment, state capture, race-based recruitment and procurement, and a stubborn ideological refusal to let go of the state's energy monopoly. But let's not be under any illusions. Declaring a national state of disaster will not conjure a solution to the energy crisis. On the contrary, if what the president has in mind is a COVID-19-like response to this, we can only prepare for a worse disaster. We can only prepare for a worse disaster. As for removing the blockages that do exist in the way of cost-effective and quick decisions being made at ESCOM, as well as the eventual reform of the electricity sector, the President does not require a national state of disaster. Think of the unbundling of ESCOM, or the failure to unbundle ESCOM. Four years, four years ago, the President made this announcement and there is still no separate entity and board for electricity transmission. No progress made on upgrading the grid, without which we cannot uptake the privately generated wind and solar that we so desperately need. The President's own erstwhile advisor, Anton Eberhardt, 
says that it is Minister Pravin Gordon, the Minister of Public Enterprises, that is blocking the unbundling of ESCOM, actively un uh, um, undermining the unbundling of ESCOM. Think of the 3,000 megawatt combined gas, uh, uh, combined cycle gas plant that had to be built in Richards Bay, which, uh, which ESCOM applied to the Minister of Energy, the Honorable Mantashe. That application was made in January last year. It took the minister five months to reply, only to tell them he wants further information. He then forwards the application to NURSA. It takes NURSA another six months to inform ESCOM that they'd followed the wrong process, start all over again. In this 11 months of bureaucratic, uh, bureaucratic, uh, what would you call it? Bureaucratic bungling, ministerial incompetence, the country's energy generating capacity deteriorated to the point of stage seven and eight load shedding. Dink aan die 150 miljoen liter diesel wat Eskom elke maand moet brand. En natuurlijk verwelkom die DA die presidentse versekering dat daar genoeg geld sal wees vir diesel. Maar die minister Mantashe het Eskom sy aansoek om diesel teen groot maatpryse aan te koop van die hand gewys. Was blijkbaar omdat hulle een of ander bergingsregulatie nie, nie aan voldoen nie. As hierdie licensie toegestaan word, as Eskom diesel teen groot maatpryse kan aankoop, kan het 6 rand per liter spaar, een besparing van biljoene vir die Suid-Afrikaanse belastingbetalers. Replacing Minister Gordon and Mantashe, the Tweedledee and Tweedledum of the electricity crisis, do, does not require a national state of disaster. And while we're on Minister Mantashe, you should really not attack the EFF from this podium, because he is in coalition with the EFF in Johannesburg. That's how these things work. But even discounting ministerial incompetence, Mr. Chairperson, even discounting that, there are regulations that stand in the way of quick and effective decisions being made to stabilize ESCOM. To this list, we can add preferential procurement and BEE. To abridge these rules, regulations, and ministerial determinations does not require a national state of disaster. In terms of section 44 sub 2 and 3 of the Constitution, the President can bring a set of measures to Parliament narrowly focused on solving ESCOM's problems, including exemptions to pre preferential procurement, BEE, diesel storage requirements at ESCOM, and anything else that, that hinders an effective disaster response. In fact, if you look at the BEE Act, at the Preferential Procurement Policy Framework Act, Current ministers can allow ESCOM exemptions from this legislation. This is the kind of ring-fenced disaster response that the DA envisages and which the president can still take up if he really wants to solve this crisis. But in the meantime, Chairperson, we have no other option as the Democratic Alliance but to challenge this latest state of disaster in court if only to prevent an even bigger disaster. I thank you. Thank you very much. We'll proceed to the Minister of Trade, Competition and Industry. NCOP Chairperson, Mr. President, Honorable Members, Fellow South Africans. While our debate today rightly focuses on local challenges, the world within which we navigate our economic prosperity is changing rapidly, with more uncertainty, volatility, complexity and ambiguity. Several megatrends are profoundly reshaping the global economy. They will impact on our lives. The State of the Nation Address sets out a number of steps that this government is taking so that South Africa can respond to these. These megatrends include, first, the impact of climate change on societies and economies that limits carbon-intensive growth, but also brings opportunities with green industrialization. Second, the new geopolitics 
of a sharply polarizing world which will shape decisions on investment and procurement. And third, technological innovation, particularly in artificial intelligence, that will uh, change the skills we need, the jobs that will decline, and the jobs that will grow. These developments occurred simultaneously with the most severe disruptions in supply chains in decades, impacting on factories in South Africa and elsewhere. They highlight the importance of what President Ramaphosa referred to on Thursday night as resilience. In their eagerness to point score an election year, the opposition speakers this morning missed these major trends taking place in the world. The state of the nation address in contrast sets out key elements to build South Africa's resilience. Six of these measures are addressing the pressing challenges of energy, building a larger African market for our goods and services, boosting investment in the economy, developing sector compacts around local production, broadening ownership and economic inclusion, and promoting local innovation. While the DA was flip-flopping on its own call for a national state of disaster, and the EFF indulged in uh, disruptive tactics on Thursday night, government was setting out steps to deal with the serious, the pressing, and the ur ur urgent challenges of energy supply. Energy shortages are damaging the economy, requiring a focus on fixing coal power stations and expanding renewable energy. In a recent visit to Saudi Arabia, the President addressed companies to invest in our energy sector. One such firm, Aqua Power, is building a large solar plant in Postmasburg in the Northern Cape, a town with evidence of a history of innovation stretching back to the Khoisan people who mined there more than a thousand years ago. This power plant will generate and also store up to 12 hours of solar energy for release when there's no sunlight. With 100 megawatts of energy, it expects to cover up to 200,000 households from this one plant. Air Liquide will this year start building a 220 megawatt solar plant in Newmansdorp, while as Minister Mantashi says, several other energy plants are currently being built. To speed up energy supply, a number of government departments like the DTIC have lifted red tape and provided more flexibility to the build program. To enable companies and competitors to cooperate on energy matters, we will finalize a set of targeted exemptions from the Competition Act within four weeks, and the Competition Tribunal will consider new measures to speed up hearings on competition cases relating to energy. To provide for a just transition, we're mobilizing support for workers to be retrained, for renewable energy components to be made locally, and for a special focus on Mpumalanga. Incidentally, the DA speaks about crossing the Rubicon, Honorable Steinhausen. History records that when Caesar crossed that river, it marked the start of an era when he broke the law, when he brought his troops into Italy, when he started the civil war, and he became a dictator for life. Be careful what you wish for. And the DA itself crossing the Rubicon, oh boy, given your policies, it's about crossing the river while abandoning the poor, discarding the elderly, and sacrificing the lowest paid in society. The abandoned communities of Itereleng in DA Ranswane, whose mayor has just uh, resigned, and Masipumelele in DA Ran Cape Town, living in misery, will confirm that. Only a small minority will reach the other side of your Rubicon. So while the DA wished that the president metaphorically crossed the Rubicon River in Italy, this government is working with 53 other African countries across the Limpopo to bring into operation a vast new African continental free trade area. Our exports to the rest of the world is growing after the disruptions of COVID. SARS reports that global exports have now surpassed 2 trillion rand and grew by a healthy 11% last year. Already we're trading more with our neighbors, exporting nearly half a trillion rand in goods to other African countries, our highest level ever. What's more, nearly three quarters of this are exports of manufactured goods, value-added exports which create jobs. We've reached record levels of exports of products to other African countries last year, ranging from, ranging from cosmetics to trucks. But we can do more. The AFC-FTA 
is an agreement that will reduce import tariffs and restrictions to make it easier to trade goods and services between African countries. On Thursday, the President noted that South Africa and four neighbours will shortly be submitting a joint offer on products where import tariffs will be reduced uh, for the AFCFTA. Two days later, on Saturday, we tabled that offer at a meeting of the AFCFTA trade ministers in Khabarone. These are important steps in driving the development of our continent. A stronger Africa is a stronger South Africa. While the EFF mobilizes on the streets with fake militaristic rhetoric, having lost the debate in this House, and the DA complains of five disastrous years, government secured private sector pledges to invest more than a trillion rand in the economy. Members of Parliament may wonder how will that uh, pledges be realized. Let me give a few examples to illustrate the impact on production, on jobs, on opportunities. Example one, the new SAPI Psycho plant in KZN that opened in September last year produces pulp that goes into the making of viscose fabrics, tablets and other products. Young fashion designer Tsepo Mohlala uses a rayon from the pulp for his new jeans range. Rural communities benefit. Example two, Google announced a large investment in October to open an undersea in South Africa, West Africa, and Europe, significantly expanding our ability to do business, to run Zoom meetings, and complete cross-border financial transactions. Example three, the recently opened Hesto Harness Plant employs 4,000 workers in Kwadukuza. Uh, Nukwazi Mbele is an electrical engineer, one of a number of women creating jobs through local distribution systems that connects car batteries, engines, lights, aircons, and more. Jobs for young people, Honorable Malema, unlike what you assert. Had time permitted, I would have provided details of many other projects, like the opening of the new Corobrick brick factory in Carltonville, or the Polarium plant that's manufacturing lithium battery modules, or food factory carry ingredients, or call centers open in Cape Town, due to DTIC incentives. All of these, the product of this government, working together with business, brings jobs to communities across the country. While the DA coalition of small parties is unraveling, and the EFF tries to divide the nation, this government is building greater cohesion between South Africans in the economy through social compacts or master plans in steel, in car production, in clothing, in furniture, in poultry, in sugar, in agro-processing and in global business services. These master plans require something from everyone. The sugar master plan is stabilizing a still troubled industry and saving jobs. The clothing master plan is shifting the sourcing decisions of major retailers. The global business services master plan is creating jobs. The auto master plan is re-industrializing the economy. Ask Honorable Steinhuizen, he will know that in Gauteng, 10 newly built factories opened in the Tswani Auto Special Economic Zone last year, producing parts for the Ford Ranger. A total of 3,200 new jobs were created in the factory and its suppliers. And the new vehicle will be exported to more than 100 countries across the world. In the Eastern Cape, the new Isuzu G-Max began rolling off the production line in Tebeja in April. We'll build on all of this with a shift to hybrid and electric vehicles, including our, uh, pursuing our interest in deepening the value chain in electric vehicle components, including battery production. While the DA is engulfed in a kindergarten leadership crisis, unable to hold onto even its black leaders, its own leaders, this government is working to widen the base for economic activity promoting worker ownership in the economy, promoting black industrialists. Today, the Commission gazetted the new market inquiry on fresh food produce markets. It's about opening that up for new entrants. In the next three months, the Commission will conclude its market inquiry into online and digital services such as property, food ordering, accommodation and general e-commerce service. It's about opening those, uh, those sectors. The President spoke about the inaugural Black Industrialists Conference held last year. They include black industrialists like D Dalisu who began commercial production in Kondo of anhydrous sodium sulfate to replace imports. 
or Brimus Engineering that manufactures industrial valves and pumps, or Cape Bio that makes enzymes used in molecular biology research and diagnostics, or Microfinish that manufactures safety components for internal combustion engines and exports 98% of its production to the EU, to the US, and to the UK. These are black-owned firms, black excellence, driving industrialization in our economy. The past year saw greater levels of worker ownership in the economy. More than 400,000 workers own shares in firms they work for, including Coca-Cola, PepsiCo, ShopRite, Imperial, Consul Grass, uh, Burger King, many mining companies and elsewhere. Not politically connected people, honorable Steinazes, but workers like uh, Makoma, Senosha, Nkobile, Yende, and Cornelius Gravar. They earn dividends from these shares, real benefits to South Africans. In some cases, nominated representatives sit on the boards of those companies, bringing the voice of workers into corporate thinking, and at the same time, giving workers an insight into the strategic thinking and challenges faced by companies. And while the DA and the EFF have shown in the SONA debate an absence of ideas and ability only to, uh, to puff up uh, wind is not ideas, heat is not energy. We in turn published a green hydrogen commercialization strategy for public comment. And this is about seeking to use South African sunlight, wind and minerals to position us as a leader in the production of this exciting clean energy. Honorable members, the year ahead is still tough with strong headwinds and energy shortages that will still limit our growth. We're working on it. And the country faces many challenges. But in these most difficult of times, we need to work together more, implement better, and focus on community needs. Join us. Join us. Let's roll up our sleeves and be part of the national effort to build the economy and build our nation's hope and resilience. I thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, honorable members. We will now break for, for lunch, uh, but please note the following. That lunch will be served at the ban banqueting hall uh, on the second floor. Uh, and for those members who may wish to go back to parliament, uh, Max Building Restaurant is open. Uh, and as is the procedure, Members pay for their own lunch, as, as we all know, and we reconvened, we reconvened at uh, 1415. Thank you very much. taken the podium speaking to the in particular to the four main uh, uh, key priorities that the president yes. had online which amongst uh, uh, which include load shedding your, your unemployment your poverty and the rising cost of living as Absolutely. well as corruption and and, crime. Uh, and fighting uh, 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 crime, crime. Mm. talking about crime with one issue that uh, minister earlier spoke on which uh, was very close to my heart the issue of uh, gender-based violence. We had him giving a list of some of the women who've lost their lives through GBV and mostly who've lost 
uh, their lives in the most brutal way. I mean, you can talk of Uyinen and Mkhwejana. We know what happened to Uyinen at Claremont Police Station, whose body was found in Kailisha. We know what happened to Nosi Tselo, whose body was found by a passerby stuffed in a suitcase in East London. We know what happened to Tseho Facho Pule, whose body was found hanging with a child inside, you know. And it was not that she was, she, she, she hanged herself, she was killed and then was hanged. I mean, we talk about River Stian Camp, we all know what happened to River Stian Camp on this day that is supposed to be the day of now. We seem to not get, uh, getting rid of this GBV. We had a pandemic not so long ago, coronavirus, countries are recovering, we seem to have overcome it, but there's this pandemic that is seemingly staying with us. Absolutely, Tembi Nkosi. I couldn't agree with you more with the sentiments that the, that the um, minister shared in terms of where we are as a country and if we have to just assess um, how women in this country actually are not safe. Women are not safe to walk the streets. Women are not safe to wear whatever they want um, in the streets. There's always a reason to blame women for why they are being beaten, why women are brutally actually being Women are actually not only just killed in normal ways, like you will just see how the, the, the most brutal manner in which um, women are being killed. And the deputy chairperson of the NCO, Pete Honorable Lucas, and a number of other women refer to this pandemic um, that is really ingrained within the uh, uh, fabric of our society as a low-intensity war against women, because it is a war um, against women, against uh, the autonomy of women over their bodies. It is a war against uh, basically just uh, the, the rights and the dignity of women to just 